Good afternoon, all. Thank you uh, for attending today's uh, first council meeting of 2019 and the first joint uh, planning commission uh, city council meeting. What I would like to start before I ask the city manager to introduce the item, because I think there is one new member of the planning commission. I would like to introduce uh, Jeff O'Krepke, who will be my new representative to the planning commission. So welcome, Jeff. <laughs> Mr. City Manager, Mr. Gillen, are you going to introduce the item? Item 3.1, Downtown Station Area Specific Plan Update, Scope and Visioning. And David Gouin, Assistant City Manager, present. Great, thank you, and um, good afternoon, Mayor Schwethelm, Chair Cisco, members of the Council, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, 2018 was an unprecedented year in many ways. Um, it was difficult, but it was also inspiring. I think we saw that uh, people came together in ways that uh, we could never imagined. And so I th as we enter 2019, uh, what you have before you is a number of policies, a number of initiatives to carry on what we've been doing for the past year to bring housing addressed, affordable housing address, uh, urban d densities, um, transit-oriented development, um, smart growth, all the things that we've been working on for the past year, um, you're gonna hear about today. Um, we're also factoring in how do we recover long-term. So from a short-term standpoint, you're gonna hear items today such as density bonus that could take effect immediately um, as we move forward to bring density and affordable housing near transit. Um, in the midterm, you're gonna hear about the downtown station area plan, which is uh, coming up here in a second, and that is gonna address things such as bringing housing and unlocking the housing units to our downtown core that we haven't seen realized. Um, in the long term, we're gonna be uh, giving you an overview of the general plan, which is going to help set the stage and give guidance to how we wanna recover and look into the future, into 2035. And so all that's gonna be happening over the next next year. Um, we're excited to bring this stuff to the council and to the planning commission. And we're gonna start off today with the first study session, which is about the downtown station area plan uh, kickoff. And to do that, I'm gonna introduce Patrick Streeter, our senior planner. Thank you. So the purpose of this study session is to specifically speak about the downtown station area specific plan update. I'll just use this button, yeah. Um, so we do already have a downtown station area specific plan. It was adopted in 2007. And the purpose behind it was to um, set forth a vision for, for the city's downtown, specifically in relation to the uh, future smart station that was, that was in development. It was a 20 year plan period. So um, 2027 was the, the end date for that vision date for that plan. Um, so we're more than halfway through it, and of the 3,400 roughly residential units that were envisioned, um, we've realized 100 constructed residential units downtown, so far short of that, that goal. Um, some may have noticed the 375 unit number that was in the Press Democrats article this morning. That's the number of units that have been approved, but actually constructed units is 100 units. Um, commercial floor area, we're a little bit more on track. Um, there was 493,500 square feet of non-residential floor area envisioned. Um, we're a little short of halfway there with uh, close to 200,000 square feet. But the, the message is that um, there was a vision in 2007 and we are falling short of that vision right now. Um, and that's the impetus for this update. So, I love technology. Okay, I'll just, you have the magic touch, I guess. So um, earlier last year, the council did set forth um, new goals and priorities and downtown development and downtown housing were set as tier one and short term goals for the council. In response to that, as Mr. Gillen pointed out, there's a multi-pronged approach taken by the city to try to address these goals. One of those strategies is to update our downtown specific plan. Um, in that regard, the city reached out to the Metropolitan Transit uh, Commission, MTC, Transportation Commission, uh, MTC, um, and applied for a grant, which we received, um, and that grant is to, to conduct this update. Um, towards the end of last year, the city contracted with a uh, planning firm, Diet and Batia, um, who have put together kind of a scope of work um, and are going to be working in concert with city staff in realizing the vision for this update. So the downtown station area is not um, limited to just the area around the downtown smart station, and it's, it goes beyond even the downtown core. Uh, it extends out um, up to College Avenue to the north, 
Um, our, our plan is to bring it out towards um, Brookwood to the east, uh, as well as Santa Rosa Avenue, and then south to Highway 12 and roughly west to Dutton Avenue. If you can go to the next one. Um, and another difference between the previous plan and this update, the previous plan was looking specifically at the smart station and the policies and goals were developed around a half mile or walking distance to that smart station. As part of this update, we would like to bring the plan to be in line with our general plans vision for the downtown core, which brings it out to Brookwood and also means that the, the plans and policies will be reflective of not just walking distance of the smart station, but also our downtown transit mall, which is um, another valuable resource as far as transit planning and environmental review. So the scope for this update, um, involves the first task, there's 10 tasks in total, and those are in response to the grant requirements coming from MTC. And the first is the project commencement and community engagement strategy. The, that's the purpose of the two um, specific plan related items that are on today's agenda. Task two, which is going to be throughout the entire process, or actually task three is throughout the entire process. Task two is what we're going to um, take the next steps for, which is developing kind of the background information. So. Uh, uh, priority development area profile, um, basically figuring out what's, what's in the areas around um, our, our transit resources, so around our smart station, around our regional arterial roads and our, our other forms of transit. Also determining the existing conditions, what the market looks like, what obstacles have, been, have there been to the previous plan that have not allowed us to realize that vision. Task three, is, it involves the outreach and engagement. That's a major component of this entire update. Um, so it's going to be throughout the entire process, is trying to get as many voices heard as possible, trying to extend the outreach as far as possible to really have a collaborative plan update. So um, it's going to involve not just the residents of downtown, um, not beyond just the 100 units that we've had in the last 10 years, um, beyond property owners, beyond businesses. We wanna reach out to potential future users of the downtown. We wanna reach out to residents of the city who are all users of the downtown. Um, and we wanna have voices heard that don't typically participate in these processes. So a lot of times people hear about a, a planning workshop and they roll their eyes and they're not interested. So we wanna use creative strategies to really get as many voices at the table as possible. Um, and we do have um, a specific item related to community outreach and engagement, which will be later in front of the council tonight. Task four is the uh, development of our alternatives. So using the background information, using the, the voices that we've heard and the, and the interest coming from our, our boards and commissions, from our electeds and from the community, we'd like to develop some alternatives. So here are some different ways that the downtown can look and here's how the plan can look. And then based on the response to those alternatives, we'll settle on a preferred plan and that would be presented for, for review and that's what we'd move forward with as, as this part of this update. And then we would develop the, um, the necessary development planning for services and infrastructure. So how can we realize that plan? What, what are the, the important considerations in bringing that plan um, to make it not just a plan, but make it something that's feasible and something that's realized? Um, that will result in our draft specific plan, which again will be circulated for comment and, and presented for input. Um, we will update our zoning code and our general plan to be consistent with that preferred alternative and with that plan update. We will conduct the necessary environmental review that's associated with that plan. And then ultimately we will land on a, a final specific plan, response to comments, and that will ultimately be um, brought to the planning commission for recommendation and then to the uh, city council for adoption. And we have a very aggressive timeline. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these are top priorities for our council and for city staff. So we are right now in the, the beginning steps of the process, but we do envision it um, being a less than a year process uh, with ultimately the final plan being developed by this summer. So it's, it's aggressive. It's going to take a lot of um, resources, but we've heard the message loud and clear that this is important. Uh, process and so so the city is taking the steps to to realize this the schedule in addition to the the lofty goals of the plan. You want to add something? So with this plan, I think um, as Patrick mentioned, we're going to be moving fairly aggressively through this. Um, there are. Um, 
uh, opportunities for public engagement throughout this process, but uh, this, this meeting today is really important from the standpoint of getting input from the Planning Commission and the Council um, and to hear from the public uh, as we kick this off. So this will be um, an important process, part, step, step in the process, and so uh, we're gonna be looking to uh, solicit feedback and we'll be here to help answer any questions and um, gonna let you finish that off. Yeah, that's uh, a very good point, is um, a lot of times when, when plans, specific plans, general plans, area plans are developed, uh, many times our boards and commissions see the, the product as it's nearing completion. So what's different about this process is that this is the very beginning, these are the beginning stages. We have a draft scope, um, we have goals and, and we have a, a, an ultimate vision that we're looking for, but this is the time that we can really get input uh, from, our, from our elected officials, from our boards and commissions. We have another meeting with the Cultural Heritage Board and the Design Review Board in a few weeks. Um, and also, as, as I've been saying throughout this presentation, public engagement at all steps is, is something that we're really pushing for as well. And we do have, uh, we'll have a, a standalone website that will be available uh, in the coming days, but currently we do have, if you go to srcity.org backslash downtown update, we have uh, a landing page which gives updates on the process. It also has a button that you can click to get onto the mailing list and, and be given updates of, of the next steps. So I'd encourage everyone to visit that site as well. And so to, to kick off the discussion, I think one of the things that uh, we wanted to make sure that you're aware of what we've been hearing to date, uh, some of the barriers to development of downtown um, as we move through this past year of, of modifying policies, reducing fees, putting incentives in place and looking at city property. Uh, we've, we've seen that the height uh, limitations are one element that uh, is something that we want to look into as we update this plan. What are those height limits? Why are they there? And what is an appropriate way to deal with height in our downtown core? Um, the other item that's been brought up uh, was parking. So how do we how do we manage parking in the downtown, both from the standpoint of encouraging creative uses of parking, uh, car share, other ride share alternatives, um, but also looking at other parking assets that we have and how can we more, more creatively use those assets um, as we move forward? Um, and what kind of requirements do we wanna put on development for parking? Um, and then the last thing I think just to touch on is um, how we uh, calculate the impacts to traffic. One of the things that MTC is look asking us to look into is vehicle miles traveled versus level of service. So again, that's an element that we'll be looking into as we move forward in the plan. So those are three examples of things that we'll be focusing on as we move forward um, and looking for additional input as well. So that concludes the, the formal presentation portion of the study session and the way we, that, that we envisioned um, the study session going was that now we would move on to questions from the Planning Commission and the Council. Um, we can respond to those, uh, those questions. We have city staff here. We also have the consultant firm uh, representatives present as well. And then from then on, we can move on to, uh, to comments and that'll give us a chance to record the, the important issues and topics that you'd like to see made a part of this plan. Thank you, Pastor, for that presentation. So the course of order there, that I have one question. If you could pull up the last slide that we had and then we'll first have um, Chair Siskel ask questions from the Planning Commission, then we'll come back to the Council uh, for any questions and then open up to comments from the public. So this is the timeline for this process. What would be a typical process? I heard you say the priority, and thank you for recognizing that this is a priority for not only this Council, but this community. What would a normal timeline look like for this type of a process? Typically, we'd look at around 18 months for this kind of process, so this is going to be uh, aggressively undertaken. Great, thank you. Uh, Chair Sisko, would you like to question? Uh, commissioners, <clears throat> excuse me, any questions? Commissioner Duggan. Uh, thank you, I've got, I've got two, and one of them is the staff report. You mentioned that the feedback you got on um, obstacles to building in the downtown area was, uh, you didn't mention what it, what it was specifically, and I'm wondering if it's the height limits, and or was there anything else that was negative about um, the potential for building downtown? Yeah, I think that what we have been hearing are the, those, uh, primarily the two, parking and height. Uh, those are two things that we've, we've determined. Um, fees were another issue and also some of the policies in terms of how long it takes to get a project through the system. And so we've dealt with those in another format. Uh, they're not, uh, it's, not app it's not appropriate to put them in a uh, specific plan. So fees, we have a fee, uh, residential fees, 
um, program in the downtown, and we've changed our review process to expedite permitting for housing in the downtown core. So we've dealt with those two big hurdles, and now this is the big one. CEQA coverage, height, and parking are, the, are, are what this will address. And then my second question is, I know we've got a, a process going on right now where the master plan for the bike and pedestrian plan is being updated, and I think it's coming forward to the commission in February. And has that been consulted as far as the downtown area and what they're showing as far as bike and ped improvements? Yeah, so we've throughout the process been working closely with the, uh, the Department of Transportation Public Works, and right now the, the, the update does reflect the existing plan as well as our general plan, and we have a, a component of this process will be what's called a technical advisory committee, and members of Transportation Public Works as well as outside organizations like SMART and um, Sonoma County Transit and uh, other other groups will be present at that table as well to give their input. So ideally, both of these plans would move forward at the same time and, and working with each other. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Edmondson. Um, so I just wanna ask uh, a little bit about the the prior projections for units and obviously we're, we're off by many orders of magnitude and. Uh, the recession being a major cause of that, but <clears throat> I think that now we're on to seven or, or more years of economic growth. We've got low unemployment. We have a lot of income inequality. People are rent burdened. So it, it cuts both ways, but um, have we thought about why that was so incorrect and what's going to be different with the methodologies that are gonna be used to make unit projections? Uh, in the materials that the council and the commission are going to get. Um, I, I would think that unless the perspective and, and maybe the ideology or the inputs uh, were different, that we would end up with uh, yet another projection that was not very useful to the decision makers. And uh, for that matter, we can expect another recession. It's the nature of uh, the economy that we have in this country. And. Uh, is there going to be any consideration given to making a resilient plan that's going to deliver units, even if market rate developers are keeping money in the bank uh, that thinks about that to the maximum possible extent? Yeah, Commissioner Edmondson, you're, you're bringing up a, a great point that uh, there's there's certain elements of development we can control as a city, and, and we touched on those, uh, the permits, the processing, the fees, um, the land use, but there are things that we can't control. There's the natural environment of, of the building materials, labor, labor costs, and, and we're not alone in that. Um, there's also one element that we found as we started this process about a year ago. There's a perception, and uh, there's been a perception uh, about five to 10 years ago that Santa Rosa did not want to see this type of growth out there. Um, so when we started making the calls and visiting people in the Bay Area asking why are you not coming up here, uh, they thought why would you don't want us up there? And so that was, that's been a change that we've had to make over this past year to say no, we, we do want to see that type of development in our downtown core. Um, we have to get out there and market it. But from a standpoint of how do we attract the right type of developers to build the right type of the housing that we want to see as a city, um, that's an ongoing effort. Um, to your point about how do we make sure that the number's realistic, um, I, I think what we what we're proposing to do is set a goal, set an aspiration, uh, set the policies in place to try to see what, to get what we want because growth will happen. Um, and what we wanna to try to do is focus that growth where we as a council, where the council wants to see that growth, which is near transit in the downtown core. And so we're gonna to continue to push those elements as we move forward. Another piece to that is um, through that outreach process that we mentioned, in addition to reaching out to the community and um, residents and business owners, we're also gonna be reaching out to the development community, both developers that we currently work with now as well as um, those outside to truly get an, an understanding of um, why we haven't seen development in our city. Um, and then the other piece to the specific plan process is creation of a market analysis to try and get an understanding of what is the reality of what could happen in, in our city so that we can try to do our very best to create a plan that would be um, uh, something that could come to fruition. Okay, great, I have a, a couple of follow-ups on that. Um, we're talking about the community members who are going to um, be invited to take part in this, of course, the entire city, but there's gonna be the advisory uh, group and then um, these stakeholder meetings. And uh, you've mentioned that developers are important stakeholders in the process, and this is a this is a process that's focused on a specific area of town. But um, 
I would expect, and I think we all um, have heard that those conversations about impediments to development and costs that the city can reduce, um, the conversations have been going on for quite a while. And you mentioned a few policies that the city has enacted to, to go in that direction that the development community has requested. Uh, so perhaps the policy could be changed on that front, but is the, do we expect to hear much new in the conversation? If I'm hearing you correctly, are we expecting to hear new from the development community on issues? Is that? Yeah, with regard to feasibility and cost, the things that would be bottlenecks to development are, have, have some of those not been spoken about you know, in I the think last few years? No, I think you're right. I think most of them have been put on the table and uh, we actually, we, we did have a uh, study done by the Council of Infill Builders, did a report on development in, in downtown and what those barriers are. They produced that report, getting input from all over the Bay Area. Uh, so th it's been fairly well vetted and it comes down again to the things, there's certain things that we can't control. I mean, like I mentioned before, materials and, and labor. And so part of what our job is to figure out how to set ourselves up and be in a position to take advantage of when things do change, are we ready to support the type of, type of development we want to see? Um, and there's there's people, uh, businesses, we're starting to meet with a lot of businesses that want to encourage a different type of housing unit in the downtown to attract and retain their employees. And so they've, they've come to the table. So we're, we're changing the, the equation by adding employers to the conversation, adding the school districts to the conversation. Uh, we're, 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 we're not doing things the same anymore. Um, and I think your earlier point about why haven't we seen this, um, essentially a plan doesn't get development to happen, but a plan plus active engagement and bringing people to the table to make something happen is gonna, gonna be the, the trick. Um, so we're gonna continue to do that. Um, we're gonna continue to try to find what those barriers are and work through them. Um, as I've, we've mentioned with the council and the planning commission, if we don't get it right or we need to see a tweak, we're, we're gonna come back to you and we're gonna keep keep updating it, keep modifying it to make sure we, we hit that mark. But uh, um, we're, we're gonna take our shot and, and do the best we can and get those housing units built. And just to add to that, um, one of the, the impediments that we have heard is the uncertainty. So, the, so that is something that a, a plan can address specifically is that we're, we're setting out a roadmap basically for the development community to say, if you're, if you're designing something that's in line with this vision, we're taking a lot of these steps proactively. We're looking at the environmental review now. We're looking at the traffic impacts now, the service impacts now. Um, so we try to remove that uncertainty so that their equations start to start to pencil out. So it's it's one small, you know, drip in the bucket of, of what it takes to do a development, but it, that, is, that is one way that a specific plan can address that. Thank you. Any other commissioners have a question? Yeah, Commissioner Collier. Can you talk a little bit more about the affordable housing and anti-displacement strategy portion of this? And I just wanna confirm it's an assumption that the Housing Authority will have a lot to do with that because it seems like they're a key player in, in regards to that. So the, the Housing Authority will be a, a component of that technical advisory committee that I had mentioned earlier. And it is, it's, it's in our scope, it's part of the, the process. So, so we'll be looking at, at, at these initial steps where we're developing a background in needs assessment. Um, we'll, we'll take that into the equation and then um, based on feedback that we receive, that's going to, to kind of model how, how we're gonna address those topics as we move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I have um, one question which actually may travel over when you get to your general plan study session, but I've been um, talking with uh, individuals that are interested in climate protection and our climate action plan and asking about policies in this particular plan that um, may be strengthened or further uh, climate protection. And I understand just the whole concept of transit-oriented development is, is in line with that, but do you anticipate any exploration of those kinds of policies being included in this plan? So there isn't, there's not a specific um, climate action piece of, to the specific plan. Certainly through the environmental analysis, we will look at um, impacts to air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but you're correct with the, the next um, study session item, which is the general plan update. Um, you know, 
one of the pieces of the general plan is our greenhouse gas section. Um, we do have our climate action plan, which is a separate document which is folded into the general plan through policies. Um, that climate action plan is in need of update, um, but at this point, um, we do not have direction um, nor resources to do that update, um, but it is something that we can talk about through that general plan process. Okay, and then, um in terms of uh, the, the market analysis uh, piece and potential land use changes as, as that is done, um, specific to the square, um, are you anticipating that that market analysis may take a look at the, um, the land uses around there, which would seem appropriate, they're a commercial retail, but they're not the ones that are that fill that need right now aren't activating the the uh, square at night. So are you anticipating any of the market analysis taking a look at that and as to how do we incentivize or or recognize that we want we want more active uses, but the ones we have are in line with the land use that's there right now. That's a, a very good point. And um, earlier I had mentioned that the 2007 plan was really focused on the smart station. And it, it, it was sort of the one of the early attempts at, at realizing the transit-oriented development, which looks at kind of townhouse development, mom and pop commercial. Um, this plan, we're, we're expanding the scope to include our, our downtown core and really look at those, those land uses in particular, which I don't think were a part of the, that original plan. Okay. That's all I've got. Great, thank you. We'll bring it back to the council. Questions from council members? Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, David. Um, quick question. Uh, you know, we talked about outreach to the development community, which obviously goes without saying, but um, specifically what neighborhood um, or community advocacy groups are, are you gonna be reaching out to to get their opinions on what this should look like as well? And uh, we talked earlier, David, but specifically about um, the folks, uh, you know, who are kind of gathering to do this neighborhood by neighborhood throughout the city in anticipation of even the general plan update. I think uh, Patrick's pulling up the, the next item. That, so we'll be talking about more about the communication or the community, community engagement component, the next item, um, first report item actually. Um, but you, you bring up a good point. There are groups out there that are looking to engage neighborhoods to get involved in these planning processes. And we wanna encourage that and we wanna work, figure out how to work with those groups and bring them to the table to help um, influence and, and provide information that we're, we're not otherwise hearing. So one of the things that is part of this plan, the most, one of the, mo the more critical parts of this plan is gonna be um, our historic neighborhoods and neighborhoods that abut the downtown. So the downtown um, is surrounded by primarily historic neighborhood development. And that that change from where historic neighborhood ends and where the downtown core becomes um, is gonna be very critical. And that conversation is gonna be really important to have both with those living in that neighborhood, but also the downtown. And so having groups out there that are engaging neighborhoods, um, pulling them out. We've, we've also have our community engagement um, um, uh, director um, in, in the audience, interim director. Uh, we've been talking about creative ways to reach out to those neighborhoods and bring them to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but that's gonna be the most important part. I think as Patrick talked about, um, the community engagement piece, without that conversation and, and without understanding the issues of, of the historic neighborhood and the transition needed to get to this, the, the density we wanna see, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we can be successful. So we'll need to engage those groups as much as possible. Great, thank you. And, and my second and final question is about affordable housing. Um, to, you know, it's, it's obviously been an objective of this council and, I, and the planning commission as well to create and spur more affordable housing construction throughout the city. Uh, of particular interest to me is mixed income communities and the downtown uh, area seems like a wonderful opportunity to start that, especially with the environmental overlay incentive but can you remind the council, the commission, and the public, uh, and any, anybody looking who is watching today, what incentives exist if you come forward with a project that has some composition of affordability built into it? Mm -hmm. no, that's a great point. So part of uh, what we're building here is a, a toolbox uh, that we can put out there for development to achieve housing, but also mixed income uh, housing. So what we've done to date, uh, we have uh, the high density multifamily residential incentive program. It's a mouthful, but there are uh, basically fee incentives for all housing in the downtown. Um, if you bring affordable to the table, those incentives are even more dramatic than the market rate. So it's a fairly, fairly dramatic drop 
in the, the fees if you bring affordable units as part of your project and satisfy, satisfy our inclusionary policy. Um, the second thing that you're, you're gonna hear later tonight, again, layers in and ties into this, is a density bonus program. So density bonus is another tool that um, uh, we're putting on the table to allow developers to near transit in the downtown area, increase density if affordable units are part of that project, which will hopefully help offset the, the intent is to offset that cost of that, um, adding that affordable, those affordable units with additional density. And so those two, the fees and the density layered on with the land use and the CEQA that we're putting forward as part of this plan um, are, is geared towards trying to achieve this goal that we, we haven't seen. Yeah. Councilmember Fulling, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you. I'm curious to know, we spoke a little bit earlier, if you think it'd be more relevant to talk to the, um, the provision for affordable childcare or childcare in the, this or in the next study session. So we have um, existing policies within our general plan that address childcare, and so I think um, in the context of the general plan update, we can, that would be a good time for that conversation to talk about what our existing policies are and whether we want to enhance them, change them, that type of thing. And, and I think the, as well, we, what we can do is uh, it, it, with the downtown, we can um, uh, Rehighlight, I guess, essentially what is available for ch child care with development projects. Um, that would be that would apply to downtown development projects because I think there are things out there that I don't think many people are aware of, and so it's a good point to bring that back up and uh, review it as we go through the specific plan. Yeah, and and uh, um, and following up on what I said, I don't think that there's any reason why we couldn't look at child care within the specific plan if we want to focus anything particularly to the downtown, um, if it looks like we are lacking in child care um, in this particular area and we want to add policies to help enhance that um, and get more child care in the downtown area, that would certainly be. Um, right. we, we have lost you know, more child care than we've gained in the last year and I'm particularly interested in making sure that child care is near our transit so that our families can access it access it without incurring more vehicle miles driven. And so we can also meet our climate action goals. Okay. Councilman Collins. Just to follow up on that, um, I support my colleague's suggestion that we integrate childcare needs, um, particularly as we increase housing or family housing. Folks don't like to drive long distances to receive childcare, um, so we, we need to make sure we have childcare where we're building housing, um, in addition to the other good points that have been made. Um, I have a couple of questions, and um, I'm wondering, it's, it's not clear to me how we're talking about the anti-displacement strategies. Um, do we have a set of anti-displacement strategies that are in a draft form? Um, are we, it looks like we're discussing it maybe even as early as the end of March, beginning of April, and I'm wondering um, what are you working with to get to the anti-displacement conversation? It's a particularly difficult nut, and what kind of data are you looking at with regard to displacement policies and displacement issues within our community? Um, so there are, um, I don't believe a, um, affordable housing and anti-displacement strategy was prepared for the first specific plan, so we're kind of starting from scratch with that one. Um, but it is part of the uh, grant requirement and something that we want to see as well. Um, so it is uh, typically done in concert with the creation of the um, existing conditions report. And so that is something that the consultant is will be working on um, okay. with their subs um, uh, to address those issues. And so we will be reviewing that and ultimately um, the document will be um, uploaded onto the specific plan website um, for the public to review. Okay. This is of particular interest to me because of the work I've done with the committee to house the Bay Area, the CASA work, um, and, and I'm very interested in um, Zug's work at Berkeley on, um, on displacement and the threats to concern about displacement in our area. Um, the new Casa Cop Pact has an overlay map uh, that gives uh, certain areas of our city some time to do certain things because of the likelihood of displacement in our areas. So um, if we need to take advantage of those things, that should be included in, in the look here. Um, 
I, I have a question about the appointment of the advisory group. Um, in, in general, I like the council to um, make appointments of advisory groups. It's just sort of a general sense that I have that, you know, council sh knows folks who may have an important thing to say. And, and I'm sure you know folks also, but it looks to me as if the appointment of the advisory group goes to um, the director. And so I'm wondering if we could uh, talk about whether that's what we as a council would like to have happen and or if we could perhaps make a recommended list for the director to select names from. Yeah, and I, I, I would um, ask that we carry that conversation into uh, the, the report item because that, that, that item okay. is all about this um, discussion and uh, we can talk about recommendations and I think that's a, a, a great idea. Okay. Um, is this the appropriate time or is another time the appropriate time to talk about uh, one of the issues that's been close to my heart for a long time, which is that we should limit new fast food drive-throughs in certain parts of our city, like the downtown. Um, does the, is that conversation for the downtown station or is that for um, the general plan? So similar with the, the daycare issue, um, it certainly could be for both. Um, if there is a particular interest in um, considering whether we want drive-throughs in our downtown area, um, that's certainly something that we can look into as we go into our visioning process. Um, but again, it also is uh, also a citywide question um, and would be a great one for looking into as our, we update our general plan. Okay, so both places maybe. Um, we have a fabulous old look on our fourth street, um, in, in both fourth streets. As we move this forward, is there an interest in preserving that sort of in, initial entryway? You know, you're gonna have a multi-story building immediately behind an older building, or is, is that in this conversation, has the, um, Cultural Heritage Board made any comments about, um, one of the buildings I'm aware of is that we have a Cress building that I think is underbeautified. We, we have what is a, kind of a fantastic facade on that Cress building. I would hate to say, first I am thrilled to increase density and height downtown. I think growing up is exactly what Santa Rosa needs. But I would not like to lose some of the historic facades that we have. How do we have that conversation within this context? That's a great point. And um, one of the reasons that I actually um, the consultant team that we chose uh, to work with is that they have on staff historic resource consultants. So a component of this process will be a historic resource inventory to, to map out what exactly we have. So that's a, a step of our existing conditions. Um, and then we'll also be looking at adaptive reuse and, and how to how to move forward with development while also catering to the to the resources that we have, and um, I'll lastly add that that the specific plan is a vision document as well. So okay. so this is our opportunity to say this is the vision we have for downtown. This is how it should look. And next week we do have a, a joint session with the Cultural Heritage Board and Design Review Board, so they'll they'll have an opportunity to weigh that's in on a, it as well. That's a good plan. I'm glad to hear that. I'll, I'll look forward to watch. Would that be in here so it's televised and we can watch that? All right. I have two other questions. Um, we've talked about a market analysis, and I may not have fully understood what the scope of that analysis is. In the past, that has tended to focus on retail, and I'm wondering if this market analysis will include leakage or a further uh, understanding of what, what our market is, what our market could be. Um, will we be including other as what, what are the aspects of the market analysis we're talking about? Well, I, th I think um, I'll, I'll defer to Patrick on what's in the scope of the work, but just, just so you're aware, from an economic development standpoint, we also have parallel efforts going on doing market analysis for development to the points you're talking about. What is, what's the true cost of development, the leakage, what, what can be sustained um, in the current marketplace? Um, okay. So that's, go that's we're doing that as well, um, okay. but there's also... And, and what we're, we should be providing that we aren't providing locally Correct. that we could do. I mean, we have a lot of places that use bottles, but we yep. don't make bottles. I mean, that's a poor example, but yep. it's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So um, the what's called out in the scope for this project um, is a market demand analysis, and it has um, several key components. One is a residential market analysis. We also have a commercial market analysis and a land use and employment forecast. Okay. 
so maybe um, for the general plan, we may want to look a little further afield uh, in terms of especially the use of our industrial sites, but that may be a general plan. Um, and I think I have asked for uh, an update on the housing action plan. I'd like to see how this integrates with our existing housing action plan and the process, project, process, progress we have made on our housing action plan, because I know we've done an awful lot. Um, and I'd sort of like to see how this ties in, if, if we could get something that addresses the housing action plan. Yes, a summary of the housing action plan elements and the stat current status is being produced right now, and okay. um, that'll be sent out to the full council in anticipation of the goal setting. And, yeah. and again, thank you for bringing this forward. I, I really uh, am excited to hear about this and to see where it goes. Um, I have also talked to a couple of folks in the downtown, one of whom requested that when we look at Brookwood, which we are not there yet, um, that we look at the far side or the east side of Brookwood and make sure it is included in downtown. Um, it's just to pass on a, a request from a constituent. Thank you. Vice Mayor Rogers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I want to appreciate your comments about Cultural Heritage Board and working with those individuals. Uh, I think the downtown station area is uh, likely to have a lot of tension where we're talking about building up and understanding that it either abuts or includes many of Santa Rosa's historic neighborhoods and the more input that we can have in coordination between those entities to relieve that pressure, I think is gonna go a long way, particularly in this planning process. Uh, I'm gonna tip my hand a little bit. Where I'm really interested in the city going is some form of form-based coding where when we have projects that come in that are appropriate within the zoning and have a level of affordability and have net zero energy or whatever our punch list that we determine is, that we are able to streamline and take a lot of the politics out of the development. And to me, a critical part of that is making sure that in this process, the community feels heard so that when things are deemed to be appropriate for being built, that they've been involved in it as well. I'm a bit concerned, though also happy about the truncated timeline if we continue to do that community engagement as well. Is the community advisory board going to be a part of this strategic effort, understanding that they have finalized their strategic plan for the year and that they're bringing that to us? Or do we need to engage them as well and get them involved in this process? So kind of similar to what we did with the Roseland specific plan and annexation, we did um, visit with the community advisory board uh, numerous times to give them updates and we also um, worked with them and they helped us do our outreach, going door to door, knocking on doors, getting people to come to our meetings. So they will definitely be a part of this process. Okay, that's great. I, I understand that many of our cab members have been briefed on it. I just wanna make sure that they are being utilized to make sure that neighbors understand what's happening as well and are brought to those meetings as well. So I appreciate that. Uh, Director, I heard you talk a little bit about the lower fees in the downtown, particularly for affordable. Uh, and I, I asked you this question and, and I'm gonna ask you in public, do you feel like you have the authority outside of the downtown area plan for that same type of program of lower fees for affordable units? Uh, at least to begin looking into information to bring back to the planning commission and the council about that. Uh, at this point, it no, we've uh, we've been focused on the downtown. The downtown has been the priority, um, and that's where the policies and fee reductions have been. So anything outside of the downtown, um, we do have a housing action plan, um, and we're following that as the guidepost for citywide. So things like density bonus and um, other policies. Uh, so if if, that, if that's something we want to look at citywide, we would need to look at what impact that has to the infrastructure funds that those support, and what that means long term for all the other issues that the city has. Going going on in terms of roads and infrastructure needs. So um, it's some, not something we've, we've fo focused on. Um, again, the focus is downtown. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And I, I am uh, interested in giving you the authority to be able to do some of that research, to come back to us and talk to us about uh, what that will have, particularly as we're focusing so much on downtown and learning what's working and what's not working. Mm -hmm. Some of that is appropriate to do outside of that downtown area as well. So I am interested in giving you that authority. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things that we will be discussing over the upcoming weeks is um, some opportunities, including um, uh, how do we use our assets in the downtown, uh, but we, we also need to have a very, very direct conversation about the condition of city facilities. And um, w you will see in a presentation next week that I'm gonna tip my hat, um, the, that I will be taking the council out 
um, on a tour of the conditions of the facilities as they exist already, um, because we need to really address our facilities um, and take care of ourselves. We have not done that um, in close to a decade. Um, and we're running into useful life issues for with many of our facilities. So um, we all want to be champions of the housing conversation. Um, we're champions in the downtown. We need to sort of test the market as it relates to that. But this is another topic that I'm going to be bringing towards the long-term finance committee. How do we finance our facilities and our own infrastructure um, because it is getting, as you saw in presentations early, or late um, in the middle of last year, um, we're reaching a crisis point as it relates to our city facilities. Um, so be prepared for that invitation, council members. Um, it'll be coming in the next few weeks. Um, I need to show you firsthand the conditions that exist out in the field. Thank you. Understood. And then, Director, I ask you pretty frequently about uh, the feasibility of bringing a grocery store to downtown. Is that going to be addressed in the plan at all? Yeah, and I, I think this is a great point. And we talked about child care facilities and services needed when you start to bring residents to an area, and super, uh, grocery stores is definitely one of those. So grocery stores, um, other services that are needed to support people living in a downtown core. So that's gonna be something we'll look at. Um, we're actively in process of trying to recruit and figure out where appropriately um, uh, places like grocery stores can go, um, and then also how they can be incorporated into de proposed developments. And directly related, I think, uh, we have seen malls across the country failing, uh, some creative things that have happened, not saying that that is for sure going to happen, continue to happen in communities, but we obviously in our downtown station area, one of the most massive pieces of, of building that there is the mall. Uh, have there been any additional conversations about what could happen if stores continue to close there perhaps the grocery store, if that was able to be brought into it. Are we engaging with Simon in those conversations? Yes, yeah, so we've reached out to them um, and we are having conversations. Uh, Simon obviously has lots of property all over the, the country. Um, and so this conversation is going on from a standpoint of housing, um, groceries, other types of uses. And so um, we're working on that. Um, and as Patrick mentioned, this is a visioning document. So I think part of what we need to do is envision what do we want our downtown to look like. The mall is in our downtown. How do we want to utilize that? Understanding that we have some vacant spots in there. So um, talking with this corporate Simon is going to be the, the conversation we need to have to understand what their goals are as well. Great. And then my last question is about the parking. I'm really interested to see sort of what you bring forward on parking. Uh, but I would hope and I'd ask that in your analysis, you also provide information to the council on what you're hearing about the sellability of units in an area that has a, a reduced parking requirement. So I think it's great to have a walkable community. If the reality of it is that people are gonna have to park on the streets, how are we going to mitigate those impacts? And is it going to be harder and thus uh, more less desirable for people to build units in downtown if they don't come with a parking space for most of us who do have to commute, uh, even if we're using public transit most of the time. And it's an interesting point. I think part of uh, the discussion that we want to have is how do we want to deal with parking? Uh, a lot of times um, our codes and requirements don't reflect, reflect reality in terms of the market. And so one of the com conversations is um, potentially have a parking maximum or something that uh, would set a bar, but to, to, to know that development, development, all the developments that we've been talking to recently, they have a marketability to them and they have to have a certain number of parking spots. And so what we want to do is look at how do we develop a plan that provides us the most flexibility to be as creative as we can with people as they start thinking about how to make their project work, um, knowing that there still is a need for parking, but how can we do that slightly differently? And just to add to that, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're not just looking at parking minimums and maximums, a number of parking spaces, we're looking at alternatives to on-site required parking. So where, where can we leverage the existing parking facilities? Where can we leverage shared parking? How can we make that easy for a developer to see how that pencils into their project? So. Um, not just the, the, the base numbers of number of parking spaces on your site, but also how does parking work throughout the downtown? Yeah, and uh, similar to my questions about the smart site being developed, uh, an understanding of where the parking is going to go if it's not on site and how that's going to impact the neighborhoods that already have cars parking along the streets. Can, may I follow up to that? So my, other, my understanding in addition to whether the unit will sell is whether it can be built. If we ha often we have a parking li limitation 
that everyone is happy with and agrees to do, and then the bank won't loan with that level of parking. Um, so if you can provide us with information about how we can uh, assist in finding partners within the lending community, um, I would be very interested in hearing that. Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I'm curious, um, first of all, thank you for this aggressive timeline and I it, it think it's important on a number of levels. Uh, what goes along with, with the, an aggressive timeline it, at times can be breaking log jams. And so I'm curious um, what your plan is for breaking those log jams and they can happen in a, in a community setting, it can happen at the council setting. Um, what your plan is to who who, do, who will it go to first, and then how will that process unfold? If you need kind of a, a person or a, a group um, to policymakers or a board or a commission to um, allow you to move forward, because in an aggressive timeline, moving forward rapidly is is going to be important. You don't have months and months to work on on single issues. And connected to that is uh, what is your plan for giving us um, progress reports, if you will, on, our, on what's, what's, the, what's the timeline for progress reports? Mm -hmm. So our, our intention is to uh, utilize the downtown subcommittee as a basis to have some conversations as we move through this program. Um, again, to have that regular check-in uh, at a more frequent basis um, than, than a, a council meeting would allow. Um, so that's our intention is to utilize that forum. Um, it is a public forum and there are three council members on that subcommittee. Um, and then uh, in terms of updates, that can come in a number of formats, either through uh, memo updates or if, if directed, a, a different approach. Um, but I think we'll look at the timeline and try to figure out and work with potentially the subcommittee on how often should we re show a, a come to in front of the full council to give an update or if it can be via email or um, notification. All right, I don't have any questions. I do want to thank you for taking the time to meet uh, with some of us individually to kind of uh, answer some of our questions. I find it very helpful. This is just the starting point of a lengthy conversation. So we'll move to uh, public comments and I would invite anyone who's interested in speaking, please fill out a speaker card. There's another opportunity. We have some of our consultants here, staff is here. It's a great opportunity to share your thoughts on this plan. So our first speaker will be uh, Susan Hildreth, followed by Peter Rumble. Hi, Susan Hildreth, uh, Interim Director, Sonoma County Library. So I really want to um, um, give you accolades for going through this process. I know it's a tight timeline, but I think it's an exciting one. And I'm here to offer support from the library, particularly we have a key facility here included in the downtown area, and we wanna make sure that we're involved with you envisioning what we could do for the community and how we can, we really have great access to community members to be involved, particularly in your community engagement, which is on a tight timeline. So we're happy, happy to help by bringing some of our customers into the discussion. And also if you'd like to use our facilities or share information through the library, we're happy to be able to participate and support you in this exciting effort. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Rumble followed by Steve Bertelbaum. Good afternoon, Council. Just uh, really echoing the same words of encouragement, gratitude, and support. Uh, your staff uh, have absolutely been tremendous to work with. Uh, your movement on uh, the downtown specific area plan is a critical piece in moving forward. Uh, the, uh, the talk that we've uh, had over the last year or so, um, and uh, just to uh, kind of hit on some points that I've been hearing uh, in conversations, uh, both data as well as anecdote. Um, this isn't necessarily uh, building homes for people to you know, move out of uh, Bennett Valley or, or Rincon. This is homes to uh, connect and uh, maintain uh, our current workforce, uh, the workforce of the future, uh, also critical in attracting and retaining business here. Um, you know, so the data from Bay Area Economic Institute say we're significantly uh, underhoused in this type of housing uh, downtown. Uh, anecdotally, uh, I have some of the major employers telling me that, uh, you know, their employees can move to other locations throughout the state uh, or the country or internationally, frankly. Um, and it's this type of housing that their employees want. So I really uh, encourage you to continue to move forward expeditiously, and we are here to support in any way possible. So thank you. 
Thank you. Steve, followed by Terry Shore. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the uh, City Council and the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm speaking for the Sierra Club and for the Transportation and Land Use Coalition, and uh, we are very supportive of what you're up to here. Uh, it's not going to be easy uh, producing a walkable, uh, compact downtown uh, with access to groceries has been a goal for a long, long time. Uh, we want to see it happen. We appreciate the expeditious approach. Uh, good luck. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Terry, followed by Ray Morgan. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Schwedhelm. Um, uh, planning Commissioner, staff, members of the public. My name is Terry Shore. I'm the Regional Director for the North Bay for Greenbelt Alliance. And uh, first, I just want to thank um, all the commissioners and staff in the City Council for moving on us. Um, this is a really exciting way to kick off the new year with um, a really um, ambitious vision for the downtown of Santa Rosa. And this is really the you know bread and butter of Greenbelt Alliance um, in Santa Rosa and around the Bay area to support these kind of projects. So I hope you will view us as um, a partner and an advocate going forward. Um, I just wanted to quote something that um, uh, a, a council member, Jack Tivitt, said to me before he was a council member when we were sitting down and talking about the downtown. You know, do we want to have a thriving, walkable, exciting downtown, or do we want to be like Stockton? And I'll never forget that, because I'm like, yeah, that is exactly what we're talking about. And I'm really excited that everyone here is moving in this direction. Um, Greenbelt Alliance was happy to have supported the MTC grant uh, with a letter to get the funding that you need to move this forward and do the secret document. Um, I hope that you will consider Greenbelt Alliance as a, a possible member of the Community Advisory Committee or the Technical Advisory Committee if you think that we uh, would provide um, some benefits to the city in, in, in that role. Um, I also would like to say that we do bring a regional perspective um, to the discussion as well as the local discussion. Um, Greenbelt Alliance has had an office in downtown Santa Rosa for at least 20 years or maybe more. Um, I would also like to thank the council members and the commissioners who um, brought up some questions about, you know, the climate action plan and addressing our climate action, affordability, and displacement. Uh, we would really support more discussion, including those important issues moving forward. Um, in any case, Greenbelt Alliance plans to be in, uh, to engage in this, help you with community outreach, and be a partner. So thank you very much. Look forward to an exciting couple of years ahead. Thank you. Ray, followed by Deborah. Hello, my name is Ray Morgan. I am a resident of the station area. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I've got a couple of things to say about uh, kudos for the city of Santa Rosa. One was one, approximately one year, or right about the time that the fires were happening. After 10 years of stumping Rob Sprinkle and everybody else, I finally got a little bit of action on Third Street. We changed it from two lanes both ways to one lane both ways with a turn lane, bike lane, and parking, just like Yalupa and everywhere else on the East Rich side of town. It has made a tremendous difference on 3rd Street. Now on to my criticism. Number one, transit-oriented is the first thing you people put into all these things. The transit center has, it was put in. Uh, Traversos went out of business. Pacific Title out of business. Still an empty building next door. Sears now out of business. The smart train was put in. There is no bus center or connection at the smart train. There is no Amtrak bus connection at the smart train. There is no airporter connection at the smart train. That ends up way over on the Veterans Center somewhere. There is no parking garage at the end of 5th Street, which was a high-rise 2009 plan that was floated, which I would love to see at the end of 5th Street, right against the Santa Rosa Creek. There should be a huge high-rise at the end of 6th Street Playhouse there to accompany all of the out-of-town residents of Sonoma County who would love to come to downtown as well as use the smart train. Okay. Housing. All developers, when I was going to the development plans back in 07, 08, and 09, every single developer asked for a variance on the general plan and the 
plans for a variance to decrease their parking requirements. None of them went through. None of the developments went through. And second of all, where will all of these people you're going to house work? There has been a concerted effort to stop and deter industry in the north of 9th Street area. There is a concerted effort to put nothing but housing on the south of 12th Street, bounded by Sebastopol Road area, getting rid of all of that industry there. Hey, housing's great. Where are these people going to work? And now you don't have commute systems to send them. We're out to Dutton, to your industrial area, where there is no on-ramp from Belvedere onto the freeway. You have to go to Hearn or Todd, both of which are overloaded and cramped right now. The city has shot down three different attempts by the Stewart Company to develop the cotton building in the last 10 years. Employer, Sears is closed. The transit center didn't help them. Railroad Square, shops are empty regularly. How many wine bars have we seen die? Shuffles Ice Cream Parlor, PJ put that in a year or so ago. He just closed doors last week. The restaurant underneath the Santa Rosa Hotel, still <coughs> empty. The, the train, Depot has no depot, no concession, no ticket, no nothing. So that's three of the four things I wanted to comment on. I live in the area. I would like to see a show of hands. How many people in this room are residents? Thank you for your comments, sir. Area? Deborah, followed by Efren Curio. Hi, um, I resonate many of this uh, former uh, discussion with the speaker. Uh, Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net. Um, I have a couple of questions and I may have missed the conversation about solar uh, ad adaptability here with the new um, environmental increase in walkable cities and new construction. Um, why I'm bringing up solar, and I'll pass this out for all of you to see when I get down there, is uh, there is a letter from Congress dated uh, January the 2nd of 2019, and it's from a congressman out of the 6th Congressional District in Minnesota. He's talking about how the Harvard scientist are now looking to explore solar dimming to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. So how would solar dimming affect the um, solar production that I see on a sign out here that you're in allegiance with and an alliance with with the Department of Energy? My second and most critical comment is about the low E um, windows. The low E windows I have seen firsthand start fires. You can type in low E windows and fires, and you will see a cascading amount of reported fires for many, many years, not only throughout the United States, but in Europe as well. If, if there is a requirement for these green energy windows, it must be known that they start fires. Recently, I had a family member who lost a home in Fountain Grove. They repurchased a new home that was under construction in Skyhawk moved in only a few months ago. And uh, just prior to the um, Thanksgiving red flag warning, uh, they stayed home because they felt uncomfortable about the atmosphere, <clears throat> the conditions. And the unoccupied model uh, home right next to them caught on fire. And at the time, no one knew why the backyard had seemingly exploded with both the mulch and the back wooden fence as, long, as well as climbing up the wooden support post to the second floor deck. It was determined a few weeks later after the developer cleaned out all of the burned rebel that it was in fact the windows. Now when you type in low E windows and fires, you'll find that they start fires and burn up neighbors' houses. It depends on how the concaved windows um, in the afternoon or when the sun shines on them because they concave. The sunlight uh, beams off of them much like a magnifying glass and starts combust they become combustible and um, fires. So I think this is critical. You almost lost a brand new area in Skyhawk that is now lived in by many um, survivors uh, that had to repurchase because of the low E windows. So I would certainly consider this a, an important um, notification to all of the rebuilds. Look into this, please. Thank you. Efren followed by Nick Kasten. Good, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm, uh, council members and planning commission staff. Uh, first and foremost, thanks to staff uh, for the amount of work that they have put forth in uh, really reaching out to business owners and various uh, 
uh, stakeholders throughout uh, the downtown core. Uh, I think that it's important for the council and for the city to continue to reinforce uh, the downtown is a unique uh, cultural, business, entertainment, uh, and civic center for the region with an abundance uh, for housing uh, and housing opportunities. Uh, the creation of uh, principles that will guide this plan uh, are something that need to be embedded uh, in the future conversations you will have with the public. Uh, creating a 24-hour downtown uh, with a focus on residential development uh, with an integrative mix in commercial, uh, civic, cultural, and entertainment attractions, I think will really create uh, the energy and the vibrancy that we want to see our downtown core have. We need to transform downtown from what it is currently now as a collection of destinations. You look at downtown, we've got the plaza, you've got 4th Street, you've got Railroad Square, uh, Councilwoman Combs mentioned on the east side, Brookwood. Uh, there's an opportunity to provide a uniqueness and really collect a, a downtown as being uh, a singular destination uh, for the city. Um, we need to enhance the attractiveness for investments downtown. You know, we talk about the various obstacles and barriers to development. Uh, you're hitting on some of the high points as, uh, along density, uh, along looking at going up, uh, but we need to find a way to uh, uh, invite uh, investors to look at downtown as an opportunity uh, for uh, uh, long-term viability there. Uh, and by doing that, I think a major principle of how you look at this plan moving forward uh, has to include uh, forging public-private partnerships uh, in high priority initiatives or high priority areas. I think Railroad Square uh, presents uh, the most uh, uh, present uh, priority to create those public-private partnerships, uh, but you also need to have uh, principles that are guiding the implementation of those plans. Uh, once again, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Schwedhelm. Thank you, Planning Commissioners, for your service, and a uh, real thank you to the staff for continuing to uh, drive this effort so that we can see collective progress across the board. Thank you, friend. And our final card, Nick Kasten. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, by way of history, I'd just like to say that when I moved to downtown on Humboldt Street between 5th and 7th, our nightlife was the old Vic, and that was it. Um, it's been replaced by, you know, Russian River Brewing and a bunch of other folks. So I think we should recognize that we've actually had quite a bit of a success in the last few decades um, in revitalizing downtown, and we're taking it to the next level. Uh, I just want to, and there'll be many more comments, I'm sure, as we go through this process, but on three things that I hope will influence how this process unveils. I appreciate the very quick and ambitious timeline that staff's laid out. Um, I would like to say that the goal should be that the timeline for projects coming in under this plan is more important than how long we spend on the plan. And what that means is having a bulletproof environmental impact report document that we can rely on when we come in for parking reductions, for traffic considerations, and for all the other elements. So please don't let the approval of this plan in a speedy matter impact the innovation that we will need in the environmental documents to actually get the projects approved. Um, because it was a matter of controversy in the past, uh, the downtown area is the one area of the city where we have a lack of all age affordable housing. Uh, the vast majority of the affordable housing units in downtown are, res are uh, restricted to 55 and up or persons with disabilities. We need affordable housing for people of all ages in the downtown area specifically. And this was a major part of the controversy surrounding some of the past proposals in the downtown area. And I'd uh, encourage you to specifically make sure that it's clear that we're looking for all age affordable housing in the downtown area. And lastly, um in 2007, when we were going through the first round of this, and I'm actually at the point in my career now where we're revisiting plans that uh, I remember us creating, um, there wasn't really any controversy around heights. I think we received one comment from the Cherry Street neighborhood uh, that was concerned about height limits. Everything else was about making sure there was parks, grocery stores, and a lot of the comments that we heard today as we're adding more, in more units. So let's, let's not be cautious around heights and density downtown. Let's be bold about it. Let's get rid of those restrictions so people know that we're open to those types of considerations in this area and um, you know, not let them read things into the fact we put in 14 stories in some areas when I'm sure everyone would have been perfectly fine with 16 or 18. So thank you all for your work. I uh, hope this will be a fun and quick process. Thank you for your comments. Fun and quick, I like that. So we'll bring it back to the Planning Commission and City Council. Chair Siska, you want to solicit final comments? Uh, any final comments from my commissioners? Uh, yeah. yeah, Commissioner Weeks, Vice Chair Weeks, sorry. 
Um, I just wanted to say that thank you for bringing this. And one of the things that I'd like to see is, um, what, which I've heard before, is flexibility and discretion for staff. Um, I think uh, Mr. Kasten got it right when he said be bold. And also in the original plan, there was an identity and character component that I think uh, really um, goes to some of the comments that uh, Mr. Carrillo uh, mentioned. And I would like to see that beefed up if we could. And uh, Roberts wrote not to be overlooked. Thank you. Any, yeah, Commissioner Peterson. Uh, so my comments are, are sort of more general, and I, I think it goes to the the sense that this is a vision document, and I think it, it's key that as it's being prepared, as these uh, hopefully new interest groups, new stakeholders, different voices that we don't normally hear from are brought in, um, that this is truly a, a sort of visionary document, that it does propose big, bold plans that allow things to stop being goals and to start becoming reality. Um, you know, I, I hope that the goal in, in another 10 years isn't to still have a, a grocery store downtown, for instance. And um, I think as, as part of this, um, I just wanna say I've, I've been very impressed with planning and economic development staff's uh, vision in responding to the fires and implementing the cannabis ordinance and uh, I will continue to put my, my faith in staff and the city to, to really think big on this and really uh, make some progress on, on these goals to make downtown uh, a really desirable destination. Commissioner Duggan. Yeah, as uh, one of the two commissioners here, including uh, Chair Cisco, who was actually on the planning commission when we did the first plan, um, and now we can see what did or didn't work, I do think we have to be bold on this one. Um, and I do have some specifics, but I do think a grocery store downtown and the Sears site perhaps, we've seen how Whole Foods kind of helped cutting town, maybe a grocery store at the downtown mall would help things there. Um, not that I think they need that much help. Um, I do think childcare downtown close to um, residences and um, work sites is a great idea. Um, and I think we included this in the previous plan, I'm not sure, but if we had a, a map included of opportunity sites downtown, um, parking lots that could be redeveloped, I think that would be super helpful and um, instructive because I think there is some tension with the historic neighborhood um, residents that maybe their houses will be next and then the bu big buildings will go on those sites, but to show where we really envision the taller, um, bigger housing structures would be um, a lot of help in the plan. Um, I'm all for shared parking. I think um, there's ways, when you see lots that are associated with businesses and they're uh, roped off and you can't park there after hours, if they could be shared with residences after hours, that would be a terrific uh, saving of, um, of paved parking lots. Um, I support having residents of historic district and neighborhood groups and um, maybe a bike pedestrian group on either the um, community advisory committee or the stakeholders group to weigh in on their points of view. Um, and I think um, being one of the people on the planning commission who lives very close to the downtown um, area and I regularly walk and bike downtown, there are lots of broken and missing sidewalk segments if part of the plan, I know there was uh, mention in the, um, the document about uh, doing a drive-by and looking at the current features. If part of the plan was to assess areas of missing and um, broken infrastructure and with a mind to uh, com connecting those um, missing links, that would be great. Um, I would also love to see a prohibition on fast food drive-throughs downtown. I think that should be included in this document because drive-throughs um, increase the, you know, surface parking and uh, car traffic. Let's see, and also is, uh, if, if this is, might not be the right document to include this in, but if there's a plan to incentivize retenanting of the empty commercial spaces downtown, um, that would be a real help. It's, there's nothing like going downtown and seeing a lot of empty storefronts that have not been rented in years. And let's see.
And also I'd love to put put in place uh, if there was a mechanism for um, cafe and restaurant owners to, to request parklets, even if we had seasonal parklets, um, to take over maybe one parking place and have an outdoor place for people to, to sit and, and um, hang out downtown. I think that would be a real boon, especially with our climate. Uh, and that's most of it. So thanks staff and um, I'm excited about the, the aggressive timeline, but I think you can get it done. So uh, thank you. Commissioner Mitzen. Thank you. Uh, it's really exciting that this process is uh, going to start and uh, a lot of it started behind the scenes. So uh, thanks everybody for your work and uh, in advance for all the hard work that's going to go into this uh, in the next few months. Um, if I, uh, if the mayor would indulge me, I would speak about this for the next few hours and go <laughs> point by point uh, with every policy. That's not a request. Everybody <laughs> stay calm. That's quite an indulgence. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just try to keep it brief. Um, I think that bro you know, broadly all the things that we want, everybody wants out of this policy are uh, good quality of life, that's simply put, and uh, what the city needs and what most people want, at least in the city, and I think really everybody at heart is uh, justice. And so with quality of life, everybody has spoken about it before, but it's, it's how many amenities can you easily access? That doesn't mean just how many are near you, but how many can you afford, um, whether you can balance the other things that matter in life besides going somewhere and your ability to go to those destinations. So a neighborhood where uh, nothing, <laughs> I can't think of one memorable good neighborhood in the world where you can drive 35 miles an hour through it without stopping and 100% of the time park exactly where you want to go. Uh, speaking about parking, uh, I'll just take a second. The, the concerns that you hear are the uh, impact on business from not having enough parking, the uh, act of parking and how obnoxious it is to have to drive around looking for a spot, uh, the expense of either paying for parking or funding parking and uh, the traffic that is created by people queuing around. I think that all of those extremely legitimate concerns will be helped by reducing parking, will be helped by road diets and lowering speed limits. I think that, you know, we're not supposed to deny climate change. The evidence is, is there. I think the case is very persuasive for all of those policies, making things better for all the people who are concerned about those things. So I would encourage everybody um, to be open-minded and um, consider all the evidence that might be out there about uh, policies that haven't been tried over the years, uh, not here and not many places that uh, are being reconsidered now because it's understood that they create neighborhoods where people wanna live. Uh, but just to the, the point of justice and inequality, we think about what it, does a neighborhood with amenities provide and you see San Francisco and cities like that that are totally unaffordable. A lot of it is to do with um, the wages that are paid there, but you know, attractive neighborhoods where people can walk are amenities uh, because they're so rare. Um, but they, we have an implicit tax on everybody in the city based on the way we've built it, where you'd need a car to drive everywhere, uh, to get to your job and pick up your kids and have an hour of private time to relax is a luxury. And it's, it's incredibly difficult to even pull that off. People are burdened, people don't have time, people are living paycheck to paycheck. So not only the density bonus, uh, strengthening that, uh, uh, consideration of affordability and economic equality in connection with every policy uh, is critical. Um, so I think that we can make a lot of these changes uh, that are going to actually be beneficial for all the stakeholders, the residents, the businesses, uh, financially for the city to be fiscally responsible. Uh, it's, it's so exciting to have an opportunity to make all of these things happen at once. Comment. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I have a few comments. Uh, like Commissioner Duggan and uh, Councilmember Sawyer, I was a part of the original plan, and and as Mr. Caston stated, it well, it wasn't without controversy. It took a long time. Uh, heights re weren't really the issue. Um, I'm really excited about this timeline. I'm excited about this opportunity. I think a really 
a really good vision was created when this plan was created. Um, it may have been a bit naive in terms of how it actually would work with the market. So I'm really uh, interested in the results of the market analysis. Um, how do we determine that tension between services and density. You know, we get people come in at the Planning Commission all the time saying, well, the general plan says I have a grocery store here and I don't, I can't walk to services. Well, you have to get the density in order to support the services. So, um, and vice versa. So I, I'm very interested in how we can tackle that and really get some hard and clear information about going forward. One of the issues that, that I had with the former plan, um, it really was all about getting um, housing up along, all, along the railway, even though it did include uh, the fact that employment supports transit also. If, if you look at the land uses in the existing plan, the, the, the employment opportunities uh, like Maxwell Court, like the Roberts Road area were um, wiped clean and made into housing or housing that could be mixed use or encouraging mixed use of mom and pop shops. And I think one of the, one of the um, uh, scoping issues will be to look at like really what's the reality of, of that? How do we shop now and how, you know, how will that work? It's a great vision, I would love that, but it isn't happening and in fact our Moore building, which was approved prior to uh, this particular plan, was a very exciting first mixed use building in the city and the retail never took off and so it's being converted to housing. So that's what I'm really uh, interested in is um, I think the timeline is aggressive but I also think it's doable because we're really tweaking the vision to looking at where, where the obstacles are, what the problems are and um, how do we go about fixing them. And, um, and I don't know if land use changes will occur. I really would like um, specifically the Roberts Road area and the Maxwell Court area looked at um, with a different view, like what are the potentials there, uh, as well as housing, because for the Roberts Road area, years ago, there were pretty grand plans for that area. It was possible that the, uh, the particular landowners uh, brought their uh, properties together. That was the, the proposed site of the Human Services Building at one time. We had um, uh, individuals from uh, like a AAA baseball team wanting to come in. I see that as a spot that could be an attraction for Santa Rosa, like the Performing Arts Center. Um, to get something more on that side of the railroad uh, tracks that uh, can be utilized closer actually to, to the depot. So I'm hoping that we can take a look at looking at that beyond just the housing uh, and, and Maxwell Court also. Well, we do need employers and I don't think the, the, the mom and pop shops are, are going to be able to do that. So that's a particular interest of mine. But um, other than that, I'm really excited that this is coming forward and I know how hard our, uh, our staff has been working on, on getting this to come forward. It's exciting that it could actually be done by, <laughs> by August and, and that it's going to be commingling with other tools that will uh, provide opportunities for housing. And I think there are developers waiting for it to happen and are excited to come forward with some projects. So that's my comments. Great, thank you. Start on the side, any comments? Mr. Olivares? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I do wanna thank staff uh, for what you've done here. I know this timeline was not arbitrary. I know a lot of uh, thought uh, was put into it, uh, and I appreciate the work that was done by, by the staff in preparing this. I think that considering uh, where we've been the last couple of years, there truly is no place to go but up. Uh, so I, I'm really optimistic about what's gonna happen. Uh, I'm looking forward to next steps. Uh, and I, and I, I, Council Member uh, Sawyer and I had our downtown subcommittee meeting last week. We pretty much put them on notice that they're gonna be very engaged in this process and I think they're eager to do that. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, I really see where we are today in 2019 really as a big housing uh, revolution and it's great to be a part 
part of that. And I know that the community is gonna be very excited about where we're heading and really and thoroughly engaged in the process. So thank you for all the work and I look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And I do want to, to echo Councilmember Olivares' comments about staff. You know, thank you very, very much for identifying the reality that the plan did not do what we had hoped that it would do, and then bringing it forward to the council and get, engaging the, the um, professional um, uh, staff to help guide this, this next plan and how lucky you are that 10 years ago, um, the the council uh, with its final product showed you all the things not to do uh, in this in this particular plan. So all of the, many of the mistakes have already been made. Um, there were good things in the plan as well, but uh, I, I think that we, we learned a lot and uh, I, I think it's very, very exciting and to, to, have, to identify that, that we had made a mis some mistakes and that to recommend to the council and, and I appreciate the council's support as well for willing to, to take a look at the plan, redo the plan, bring it up to, to the, the, you know, the 21st century and uh, go forward with something that will truly create Create um, a 24-hour experience and something that we that the entire region could be proud of. Thank you, Mr. Tibbs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, two quick things. Uh, one is I, I wanted to echo what Commissioner Duggan said about the parklets. I think those are pretty cool. And I remember when I worked for the Economic Development Board, did a little research on their impact on small businesses, and, and there was a um, significant impact, positive one. The, the second one is a little bit more serious. You know, when we look at that map of where the specific area plan is gonna be, we're not just talking about the downtown, which is predominantly retail and commercial as it currently stands with limited residential. There's a lot of residential in that area. And when I look at that map, I notice in particular that there's a large um, number of working class households uh, in that area. And so, and what we're talking about doing here today, although magnificent and absolutely should be pursued, we should, as you are, based on your staff report, go into this eyewise open about gentrification and what those impacts can have on these particular neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm fine with the technical advisory committee taking on just about everything in this process going forward. But one thing this city council has done its best to do in the last two years is really try to look at policies that make sure that we mitigate displacement and give everybody a future in Santa Rosa. And I would like um, the question of the anti-displacement -dis policies to come back to the council speaking personally. I don't know if my colleagues agree, but there's a lot of things that we can do, particularly, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but the housing authority had, um, or at one time looked into uh, a home ownership, home buying program, um, but I think last time I checked in on it, it was just unfunded at this point. And, you know, there's no better way to mitigate against displacement, in my opinion, than turning people into uh, equity sharing um, homeowners in their community. Um, so looking at policies like that and others that, that make sure that everybody gets to go through this transition with us. So I'm just gonna put my plug for that. Ms. Fleming, any comments? You don't have to. No, no. Ms. Combs. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I really wanna thank staff for achieving this grant. I mean, it wasn't immediately obvious that we would have the resources to do this kind of dive that we need to do and that we would be able to resource doing it this rapidly. So uh, I very much wanna thank you for um, for achieving uh, the grant that you, that we have managed to, to get. Um, clearly, a key element of this is that what comes out the other end, downtown development needs to be predictable. So folks who apply will know if it's gonna flow through or if it's gonna have a barrier or, and they can choose, you know, as one of my colleagues talked about form-based codes, at least moving towards something where people understand uh, the CEQA is fully taken care of for this, this example or that, the, that the, the design review board already okays this or that cultural heritage likes this particular light fixture on an exterior porch. Um, as we move those things forward, 
the individual builder can say, I want the predictability and I'm going to build it as you, as you have said you want and go fast. Or they can say, I want to do something more uh, unique. I, I don't like the phrase more unique because you can only be unique. Um, deciding that they want to try something different will take a little longer. Um, I think we, we just really need to, whatever comes out the other end of this, it needs to be able to be predictable for the builders. I think that's a key goal. And I'm not really hearing, uh, as long as we have strong community engagement, strong engagement of the neighborhoods, I don't hear any disagreement on, on our council for that. I, I think we have uh, an amazing unanimity around moving things forward in such a way that we can get this in a predictable way. Um, I started on uh, council, you know, around the time that this was coming forward was when I got the idea I might like to run for council uh, in 07, because I was concerned about making sure that the neighborhoods, that the leaders of the neighborhoods, of the folks who live here now got a say in this process. Um, so I'm still very concerned about the community engagement process. I know that that's coming forward. Um, I also wanna make sure, we're talking a lot about affordability. It is my experience that people do not understand what the technical term, the term of art of affordability is. If we can start talking about it in terms of what is the salary level of a teacher what is the salary level of a back of house restaurant worker? Is that in the 80% zone? Is that in the 60% zone? Whose housing are we talking about building? Um, is it the senior who is living on their social security retirement? Uh, I strongly support the idea that we want, as I think was mentioned by a previous planning commissioner, um, that we want all age affordable housing. I, str I strongly support that concept, but it's helpful in talking about it. If we talk about the term of art in terms of whose housing it, are we talking about building? And I think it's sort of a buzz phrase right now, but we haven't talked about the missing middle. And that has two elements. The missing middle is the folks who are at 150 to 200% of area median income who also can't afford to live here and who don't meet the criteria for the term of art affordable housing. When I started the process of looking at housing homelessness and affordable housing, I had a lot of objections to the missing middle because I was afraid what would happen is that's all we'd built. But we, we can't also neglect them. We, we need that missing middle housing. And oftentimes that housing is the two, three, four, five story housing that might be the buffer between a single family residential neighborhood and the 14, 16 story downtown building. So I think we, I would like to hear how that's going to come forward. Uh, I think that missing middle piece uh, is at least one of my goals as well as the predictability goal. Um, and I just, again, um, am really aware of how united our council is for, um, having an up vision downtown and for, uh, as I think one of the speakers said, literally taking it to the next level. So thank you very much for doing that. Vice Mayor Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'll be really brief. I actually woke up this morning in Sacramento overlooking the Capitol and in the backdrop there was a crane that was swinging in their downtown building something. And I, I pulled out my phone and I took a picture and I sent it to Councilmember Sawyer and I said, when do we get our crane, John? So I'm really hoping uh, he gets to see that over the next couple of years as well. Uh, many of us at the dais grew up in Santa Rosa. It's time for the city to do the same. And if we're going to be accused from time to time of being dense, I hope this council will own it and make it so. 
I'm just anxious to hear if uh, Councilmember Sawyer had an answer. When are we going to see that swing? Um, so again, I want to I want to thank staff. Um, and it's kind of interesting hearing these comments. For me, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. It'd be great to have the housing, but we're not going to have housing until we have downtown grocery store. Well, grocery store folks are saying I'm not going to build a grocery store until we have housing. So it'd be great to see how we kind of resolve that and incentivize it. So we need it all like yesterday. Um, I also want to um, thank the consulting team. Some would say um, I draw, drew the short straw. Others would say it was a great opportunity to sit through a day worth of interviewing six or seven consultants along with city staff to hear the presentations. And I'm very confident with the skill set that's present. And uh, one of my key uh, interests is making sure the community input is, is heard and listened to. So, and I, I think that's just not a responsibility of the consultant team, it's all of ours. And when I say all of ours, not planning and city council, everyone in the chamber and the millions listening at home. Um, spread the word, we're interested. This is a great opportunity and it's gonna be fast track. This is not gonna be, there is a window of opportunity here, but that's huge for me. It is a window of opportunity. So my expectation will be, we're not gonna have anyone in this chamber at the end of this process saying, I never knew about it. And that's gonna take some active participant from ev participation from everyone in the community, not just staff, not just the consultants. And I know we, um, they've got a great resume, at least the uh, community outreach with what we did in Roseland, because I did hear that. And that was great hearing some people come in and say, I may not have liked what you did, but I felt like I was heard. And that's for that community engagement. That's what I'm really interested in. I want people to feel that they're heard and we're in this thing together. So I really appreciate the efforts. And with that, is there anything else, uh, Mr. Gruen, you'd like to say? Nope, that's all. Thank you very much for all your, your input. We appreciate it. Okay. With that, I'll adjourn the special joint meeting of the City Council and Planning Commission, and we will take a brief recess to rearrange the chamber. Thank you. All right, why don't we reconvene our city council meeting, city clerk uh, announcement or roll call. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Flemings. You're correct, she's not there. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Mr. McGlynn. Item 5.1, general plan 2035 update. David Gouin, assistant city manager presenting. Thank you, and again, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Schwethelm and members of the council. This uh, second study session um, it has to do with the general plan update, so different from the previous study session, which focused on the downtown, this is uh, to talk about the general plan update for this entire city, uh, what the city is envisioned to look like in 2035. Uh, the reason we're bringing this to you tonight uh, is for twofold. One is to show the uh, what what the downtown specific plan is and how that differentiates between a general plan um, and what the general plan is. And second is to give an overview of, of what a general plan update, a comprehensive update looks like and how is it different than what we've done in the past. Um, part of this is the fact that um, a comprehensive general plan update is a massive undertaking. Um, we have, uh, it takes every department um, in the city, it's gonna take the entire community uh, to pull this off and lots of resources. And so going into council goal setting, we 
wanted to make sure that the council had a full understanding of what the general plan is and what it entails as we look at embarking on that in 2019. Um, Can I so interrupt you briefly? Uh, absolutely. Um, I just want to make an announcement for everyone in the chamber that apparently we're having some technical difficulties with the televising of this um, hearing. So it is going to be taped, but it is not televised live as we speak, but it will be up and running as soon as we fix the technical challenges. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, um, I would like to uh, turn it over to our senior planner, Andy Gufferson, who will give uh, this presentation and both myself and uh, supervising planner, Jessica Jones, will be here for questions. Thank you very much, members of the council and mayor. Um, the general plan is a, uh, as David said, a comprehensive document. It's a vision of uh, the city and it informs how the city proceeds with a multitude of projects, including public and private projects, infrastructure planning, how we develop uh, our neighborhoods and res um, downtown commercial areas. It is general and it's distinguished in that way from a specific plan like the downtown plan. It lays out broad goals and uh, implementation measures. It doesn't go to form-based type design, but it does talk about intensity of development. It is built on community engagement. It is built um, on past experiences and it responds to current challenges. Uh, it, it is used for us to help define what will be our uh, desired outcomes, our goals in, in the community. There we go. Um, so the general plan update would uh, always look 20 years in the future. Our current general plan looks out to 2035. It was adopted in 2009. So now 10 years later, it's time to revisit the, uh, the plan. And we would be looking forward to 2045 uh, as our planning horizon. It's our opportunity uh, in the update to revision our goals, to go back out to the community and uh, ask how have recent events and trends shaped our ideals, our, our expectations of what the city should be. Um, it, it allows us to look at uh, issues like streamlining development review and, and also it's an important opportunity for us to integrate recent state law changes. And, um, some key events that have occurred in our community in, in the last 10 years is a, a ongoing and persistent low production of housing and, and uh, in, increased difficulty with housing affordability and also homelessness. In last year alone, we had uh, a number of events, including a really positive um, event with the annexation of Roseland, which brings in a, a community that's gonna be very dynamic and additive to our, our, uh, our city. And we need to look at how we integrate not only the physical um, form of that area, the, the uh, building increasing development in, in that area or how development might change over time uh, and, and how circulation works and integrates with the city. Um, we will also uh, be looking at how do we recover from the Tubbs fire disaster and, and what, what are we doing, what should we be doing to help build neighborhood resilience? I think the images on this particular side are phenomenal because out of disaster, what we're seeing is a lot of neighborhoods getting together and start to build that resilience. And the general plan will build upon that kind of uh, neighborhood engagement and opportunity. Let me point to, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, We've also had some changes in, in services um, uh, or, or activities in the community. We have Smart Train that has come in that does change the dynamic downtown and the railroad square areas. Uh, I've mentioned the annexation. You, you talked about the uh, downtown specific plan update. Um, these are all significant um, things that we can respond to in the general plan to help reinforce these additions to our community. 
The red area on that uh, exhibit does show a designation of a portion of Roseland that uh, has labeled it a disadvantaged community. And that's a designation that came out in 2016 um, on the state, by the state that establishes that this is an area that's burdened by, disproportionately burdened by uh, lower income households, uh, concentration of environmental pollution, and uh, in some cases lacking infrastructure. And I'll speak a little bit more about that designation. The general plan is, um, uh, for some, a highly structured document. It, it is a document that's required of all counties and cities in the state. Uh, we do, uh, ours uh, fulfills the state's requirement generally in terms of its form, and it needs to address a number of topics or elements uh, the, 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 that are listed there. Housing, obviously, is a very present one. Um, the housing element, which this council has uh, considered in the past years, uh, is an ongoing element that gets updated, but we have all these other elements also, including circulation, land use, air quality, safety, noise. They are all topics that a general plan must address. And in our, the challenge that we face when we update our general plan will be to um, look at these individual issues and be able to analyze our current community setting and then look to how do we wish to influence um, the, the outcomes in these various topics in a way that they all work together. So one important linkage will be um, how we work with uh, our uh, land use to implement new environmental justice policies that are now required because we have this designated uh, disadvantaged community in, in, in our city. Um, we need to look at how we're gonna use land use policy or our public safety policy to provide infrastructure that might be lacking in, in that particular, that portion of Roseland uh, area. Or we may be having to look at how we might provide better pedestrian and as well as vehicle access in that area in our traffic and transportation circulation plan. Um, so the the, General plan elements, um, although there are different topic areas, all have to tie together and, and reinforce one another to support a common goal and vision. Um, I list here on, the, on this slide, CEQA vehicle miles traveled. Um, that is a unit of measure that is now required for environmental analysis in uh, preparing a general plan, which really gets at the issue of how do we reduce travel within the community so people are not so dependent upon their vehicles and in that way uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is an important measure because it really gets at the core of how air quality might be improved, not only in this city, but also in the state to help to meet its uh, greenhouse gas emission goals. That's a complete change in emphasis or approach from looking at how we might reduce congestion in intersections, which really is a measure of personal convenience and delay. We can have policies for both, but we must reconcile this vehicle mile traveled um, measure in our general plan. And that's a technical change that we'll implement in this update process. There are a number of significant issues. I've touched on some of these and, and you're aware of many of them already. Um, the downtown specific plan, for instance, is striving to intensify downtown development. That'll touch upon housing and land use. We already spoke about the Roseland annexation. We wish to incentivize all housing, market rate and affordable housing. The general plan provides us a platform to do that. Um, very important uh, from our experience in 2017 will be to plan for avoiding hazards and how we might reduce hazards. And it's not just fire, it's also flooding, it's, it's also um, earthquake seismic events. And, and it's not just physically trying to avoid, but also how do we prepare our community for these inevitable events so that we can bounce back and, and build into our community community resilience. The general plan is it's citywide, but it's parcel specific. So we will be looking at um, 
how each land use or how each parcel is is designated in terms of land use, how we wish neighborhoods, uh, we hope that neighborhoods will be evolved and developed over time. And um, we will be looking at citywide policies to help to ensure, for instance, that every one of our citizens will benefit from environmental justice, have access to shopping or a host of other sort of community goods and benefits that we hold as very core to our city vision, our principles. Um, so we'll be looking at housing, commercial development, industrial development, intensity of, of land uses, and connectivity, transportation throughout the city. And as was mentioned previously, this is an all hands event. Um, that diagram showing all those topics, um, no one department at the city owns that diagram. There are departments that play significant roles in each uh, or several of those uh, topic areas. So when we go through this update process, we'll be engaging everyone in the community, everyone in the city uh, in, in its departments, as well as our um, uh, uh, partner agencies at the uh, local, regional and state level to work through um, the general plan so that we understand the, the regulatory context that we're working within, the community, the, the soft issues, you know, the social issues that, that uh, we're, we're living with and, and come through this process where we can formulate goals based on good information, bring those goals out to the community and have them reviewed and shaped by the community and as this goes forward, we begin to define alternatives and, and um, a preferred approach to how our vision is gonna be stated, what our city is gonna be looking like. Um, I want to call attention to the right side of the diagram, the green sequa arrow. Um, that is the third rail. It's very, very important in this process throughout our community engagement and throughout our analysis on a technical level, we need to be mindful of, of how our plan will develop the city in the future and what environmental effects it'll have. And um, the third rail aspect of it is that once we develop that plan and we have reconciled the CEQA issues, we have a very solid foundation upon which that plan can be implemented by city projects and by private investment and, and uh, development. That CEQA document becomes a foundation for other analysis that uh, will be conducted to for environmental review on the project level. So that's a very, very important part of our effort here. Um, this diagram is just simply a, a schematic to show that there are these steps um, and, and it will take a three year, probably two to, we're gonna say three year time frame to move through this. Um, the one long bar across the top, that's community engagement. That's to reinforce the idea that it starts in the beginning and it ends with community engagement with constant touch points throughout the process. As we're analyzing the community setting, we're sharing that and informing the neighborhoods about issues in their, in their situation, in their place. As we consider alternatives, we're going back to the neighborhood and, and constituent groups to get feedback on proposals or policy directions that will be formulated. And then as we come to the process or the time when the planning commission and then ultimately the city council um, will consider and take action on the general plan. Um, we will have behind us here in the audience, a group of people who are educated in the issues, have participated in the formulation of policies, and hopefully will be here to be able to clearly identify their concerns so that you can take action, knowing that you've heard from everybody on the, on the issues. Um, this is, level of effort, the intent here is just to kind of show roughly what we think will be the allocation of effort to get the whole thing done. The big part of it is gonna be public engagement. That's going to, um, as I said, run from beginning to end. 
and it'll be a substantial part of the cost, not only in terms of effort, but also in terms of price. Um, we do envision going out, I think you heard today with the downtown specific plan, the idea of reaching out to folks that don't normally come to hearing and speak up. We wish to use technology, we wish to uh, reach out to groups that don't necessarily perceive that this is a thing that matters and go to venues where we can help to educate and inform people that through surveys um, and, and through other ways of collecting uh, public opinion, what they're thinking about, what they're hoping for, and, and what, what we might help um, attain for them through the process. The other big part of, um, of this is you see CEQA, which I've talked about already, but also the community vision and policy framework. With a comprehensive update, we're not throwing out our current general plan, but we are really rethinking it. We are going beyond just simply updating our current general plan to comply with state law. We're really looking at, does this framework work for us now? It's a, we have a different set of issues in front of us in the next 20 years than we had in 2009. So today we wanna be able to go back to our general plan and really think what kind of a general plan framework do we want? Um, and, and that gets at how we, is it a paper-based document that lives on a shelf or does it live on the internet where people can use it to actively pursue a particular topic of interest and help them resolve how they might best engage the city to implement, let's say, a neighborhood uh, change or issue. Um, the you know engagement can happen at a number of different levels, and and what we've done here, I think, from what I understand, is we've done a really good job of involving, and I would say, collaborating with community. We need to get into the collaborate box completely, if not empower the public through this process where when in the future we've adopted a general plan and a project comes in in a neighborhood, it's not a matter about the neighborhood coming and go, why this project, why this intensity? It'll be a, an issue of, yeah, this was a tough project or this is an important project and we understand that there are a lot of issues to rec reconcile and we had that conversation and let's work it out. It's not about no, it's about how. So I think the engagement where we fall in, in, in this continuum is, is going to be a really important thing in the goal setting process with the council in February. Financing is always a big issue. Uh, we do have funding that we collect ongoing with building permits specifically allocated for advanced planning efforts such as the general plan and um, I'm going to say that it's, it, financing this will be an on, ongoing challenge and we will work to get grants to augment that. So next steps, um, in February you will be um, doing goal setting and then, um, then it's a matter of uh, supporting those goals with um, a commitment to budget and once we have that in hand, we'll prepare a scope that's commensurate with uh, council direction and prepare an RFQ, RFP to the development community um, and begin the process that in this spring. My hope is that uh, in the summer, we'll be able to report that we've selected a project team and that we will commence work on uh, our data collection, public engagement uh, and outreach. That concludes my presentation, and I, if you have any questions or comments, I, I welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that presentation. Uh, Director Gillen, could you, I know you had shared with me, both of you did, how this fits in with our previous presentation and our later presentation. Can you just, again, outline how each of these steps and what you're trying to do by informing both the council and the community about the processes that we're, we'll be following? 
Sure, yeah, the uh, previous presentation, which was the downtown specific plan, uh, is a focused effort for the downtown area. Um, it's more in depth, more a deeper dive, more specific uh, uh, analysis of the downtown um, and CEQA um, evaluation. What the general plan is, is citywide, and that's gonna be at a much higher level. The, the, the work we're gonna do on the downtown specific plan is not lost. That information and that work will then be in, incorporated into the general plan, uh, just as we did with Roseland. Uh, there was a Roseland specific plan. Uh, they'll be looked at, but that a lot of the work and engagement that was done there will be brought forward as part of that as well. Um, so what we're doing today with the general plan is to give an overview, um, because it is time to update that. We've had significant events. It's time from a standpoint point of it's been multiple years and our other partner cities and agencies are, are embarking on an update as well. So the county is looking at updating their general plan um, and a few other cities in the region are also doing it. So it's a good time to work together, look at this regionally, how are we intersecting um, and moving forward together. So uh, this report really is to kick this off, give a heads up, understand what the general plan is, what it consists of, the level of effort, so we can have a more informed discussion when we set council goals. Thank you, Mr. Simeon. Yeah. And I would just like to add that this is going to be in it. When we sit down together um, to do the goal setting, I, I really wanted to have this um, topic brought forward in this format so you can start to think about it, how you're going to do, what, what are you looking for in the general plan update, what specifically items you want us to investigate, how you want us to go through a community engagement process, because that's gonna shape sort of the budget, the scope of the project, um, staff commitment, you know, what, what resources need to drive so that as we get into the budget process, we can better understand what council's vision of this particular enterprise is. You saw, we, we, we want to fulfill that vision. We wanna move the engagement needle from where we've been sitting, which is inform more towards the empower, but with, with that comes resource commitment and, and staff time commitment, the things you've heard, but I wanna have a dynamic conversation with the council about how we wanna prioritize, how we wanna tackle this. We've gotten lots of feedback from um, individuals in the chamber about how this should be approached, um, and I need some clear direction so as we go into the planning process and the time allocation and the resource commitment, we have a real good idea of what council's desire is and how we can meet that objective. Thank you, that's helpful for setting context. Running back to council, questions? Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my questions are more specific to the uh, Roseland area. Uh, we went through a, a long process, uh, decades long, <laughs> of annexing Roseland, and we finally accomplished that, and that is a good thing. And I think the outreach uh, and engagement that process that we used there were, were very beneficial. Uh, my question is, uh, what do we need to do to assess their level of readiness to participate in this effort that they're used to a different process? Uh, so I think we, we need to find a way of assessing maybe through the connection we've already had before is do we need to do, do anything more before we really dig into this to make sure that they understand what this is, the historical pieces of our general plan and how they're gonna be engaged so that we kind of, I guess, in a sense, catch them up with the rest of the city as far as the level of engagement. So I guess the question is, how will we assess their level of readiness to participate? The onset of the program will be a marketing, news, information surge through a variety of channels is what I envision. Um, to get at precisely that point, a lot of people don't really connect the dots about a general plan amendment and how it matters to them or their community. And this is, an important first step in our um, reaching out to the public is we're embarking on this program, here's what we wish to accomplish, here's what we've done in the past, here's how we're gonna approach this now. Um, so I, I think um, we're not going to assume we're walking into communities that understands what this means. We're, we'll be bringing forward a proactive education on uh, um, introduction to the general plan and how they might participate. 
And, and to follow up, Council Member, I think that's exactly the question we, we want to take a more deeper dive on the in February, specifically on where are those areas that you want us to uh, maybe focus on to prepare for this process that might impact the timetable, the the process we undergo, and the investment of the resources. So that's exactly what you know. This was sort of an educational space to get more into that conversation and see where Council wants us to direct the energies of this process and how to shape the process over the next, the initial phase over the next 18 months. Thank you. Other questions, Ms. Combs? Thank you, Mayor. Um, really excited that we're going to do this. I, it's time. You're right, the timing is, is a good time now to be doing it. Um, with our um, significant changes in the community, uh, both the annexation, the fires, the relationship with the county. I think we've seen a lot of transformation uh, and it seems like it's a good time to, to have our plan reflect that. So I really thank you for that. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, looking at, I think it's slide 11, uh, not so critical that we go to that slide, but um, you mentioned the CEQA on the right side and you mentioned that it is the third rail. One of the things I'm looking for to come out of our CEQA is that, again, we facilitate predictability for folks who want to do a land use after we've completed this project, this process. Um, how can we make sure a project can move forward more rapidly? If we have a full discussion now during this process, I'm hoping it will eliminate some of the um, barriers that CEQA can present later by taking care of them at the beginning where we are. So can you clarify for me how much pre sequa work can we do to offset the amount of sequa work that a developer has to do later? Um, so what comes to most immediate mind is uh, traffic in our community is always uh, a major issue with development and by doing a robust land use review uh, so we can accurately characterize intensity of development throughout the city and understand our streets and roads, we can develop in our CEQA analysis a very clear traffic modeling impact assessment so that when a future project comes in that conforms with our general plan land use designation and fits that density, that CEQA traffic analysis is reduced substantially. And in some cases, we can use and leverage the um, CEQA exemption for infill development with a current general plan. And we begin to we begin to build that predictability so that uh, there's less uncertainty for a developer to come in. So I want the developer to know both what is and isn't okay so that they have predictability. I'm not suggesting that everything's okay, just Correct. that they should understand what is and isn't. It's very important to me that as we do the community engagement piece, that the community understands the traffic discussion. Uh, I also am concerned that the community often doesn't understand when they see some designation, and forgive me, I myself sometimes mix up what's zoning and what's general plan. So keeping what's zoning and what's general plan clear is very helpful. I, I'm hoping we can do that. Um, but I'm also concerned that in the community, folks don't, um, they're going to need specific examples of what can be built on a site labeled X. Um, so the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? for site label X. So as we do the planning, the public needs to have really concrete understanding of what it is we're talking about. And I'm, 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 I guess I'm asking you, can we do some specific examples of what is included in the classifications with a typical photo from around here? Are we able to do that kind of thing? And, and certainly we can. Okay. The general plan, um, 
not only relies on words, but illustrations and diagrams and, and they're, they're important components of communicating the message. So it's often that um, If you go levels. to somebody and say, I want to see one next to you, they don't really know, you know, whatever designation commercial is, means. They don't know what it includes and doesn't include. It, but, but I do want to add that the rapidity of change that's going on in the marketplace right now is going to be very, very difficult to articulate all types. Obviously. And, and, and so I'm going to give you an example of what we know is coming is, is uh, huge advancements in 3D printing based upon uh, the ability to print metal. So what's going to, what, what I'm understanding is going to be happening is that actually um, manufacturers, manufacturing sites may have multiple uses, but getting us to be able to articulate that fully is going to be a difficult. So you're, it's going to be a balancing act between certainty and, and some flexibility because the market is under such Yes. change and such stresses with the with how quickly um, technological advances are coming. So I so do want to... We I, have I do, to understand how to express to that, people what the range can be. And, 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 and that, that we, we have limited ways to right. forecast some of that change even in the midst of this environment. So we have some industrial sites, some light industrial sites. What's the difference? What's What's... What goes in where? The commercial sites, there's several commercial designations. Folks don't understand what those differences are. It, 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 obviously, we can only predict what we can predict. It's hard to predict the future. Um, the, the, the other question I have has to do with the financing part, which was your slide 15. Um, we have a very sales tax based city. But it, in the general plan, will we be looking at how we fund our city as we move forward with the general plan? Generally not. Uh, it, uh, the general plan specifically uh, at the state level requires a number of elements and we looked at that previously. Finance is not typically a part of it. Right. Our general plan does have an element that talks about, um, uh, I forget the title of, uh, of the chapter, but it, it looks at fiscal issues. Um, if, we, if we plan all single family residential housing everywhere, we, we as a city can't go forward. Single story, single family residential housing. We could plan that the way that I've seen this sort of described. And as a city, we couldn't afford to be a city. We so I, I want to make sure that we've planned in fiscal accountability that what if it's built, we can afford it <laughs> and that it will generate the incomes we need. Yeah, and I think, I think you're hitting on a good point, um, similar to the Urban 3 analysis we did for the downtown yes, and what, what impact that has on and why we're even focusing on building downtown. That, that type of analysis definitely could be done in looking at what, what are the pros and cons of decisions we make of certain types of land use. And like you said, is this a single family? What does that mean for us? What's the liability to the city long term? So absolutely, I think that could be okay. looked at. It, it concerns me particularly, and again, we're talking about projecting into the future what's What's the future going to look like? Um, what I'm hearing from my children and my children's friend is a kind of minimalist approach, less shopping, owning less. Uh, if we're sales tax based and we design without taking into account the fact that by economic necessity or environmental necessity, we may not have access to sales tax funds like we used to because people don't have the money or the inclination or the environment isn't doesn't isn't served we need to think about that as we plan and i'm wondering how we incorporate that kind of projection into a general plan that we're using and I think part of this is going to be looking at, as, as Andy mentioned, what is the, the base case, what are, what are the trends, and I think we, as you're touching on the, the trends of more service-oriented type of retail versus a, uh, a product, sales of goods type of thing where you can shop on, online and do other things. So those are the types of things that we'll be looking at in terms of a access to services. What does that do from an economic development standpoint? But economic development is going to be a key part of this as well. Okay, so when we talk about the financing section, 
I'm, I'm eager to hear from you how we can afford to do a good uh, projection so that we're projecting the future fiscally as well as, as um, land use. Well, and, and They're and kind even, of interrelated. And, and council member, even if that's not, this is again the sort of information we're gonna need to understand how, how you wanna, how the council wants to envision the community for 2045. And some of these elements not may not play directly into the general plan process, but if they're gonna be critical to decision making, and, and I think they are, yeah. um, we're gonna need to figure out how we get that information um, to you to help make that decisions. And those potentially are cost centers and timing issues about developing that material um, for making decisions. There are lots of ways to approach a general plan update and, and some of them can be minimal, and some of them can be more <laughs> I, I, wide ranging. I it's, think uh, I'm looking at a, at least fiscally a wide ranging approach. And, and, and that's, that's why we really wanna have this conversation. And, and you know, even, we don't want you to stop today. I mean, you can ask questions today, but these are some things that we're gonna wanna know as you go through the process of, of goal setting, what are you looking for in this process? What information do you need to make sound decisions um, so that we can put together what we think meets those, those requirements um, as best as possible? Thank you very much, and thank you. And if I could just quickly also add, um, we do have an economic development vitality section of the, um, the general plan, and that includes all kinds of policies on maintaining economic vitality um, throughout the city, and so that is something that would certainly be a part of this update, and we can make sure that those policies are on track and adjust them as necessary. Thank you, and I appreciate that the fiscal section might really have been targeted toward how do we how do we afford to do the general plan? Uh, and I appreciate your allowing me to sort of stretch what that financing meant. Thank you. Vice Mayor Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in particular, one of the things that I'm interested in seeing in this discussion, when this comes back to us with, uh, call it a final product or a draft product, is really a discussion around which areas of the city will end up becoming legal non-conforming uses in the adoption of the plan as well. Because I do think that that presents a specific set of uh, issues for us down the road, trying to actually get to an implementable point of what we are envisioning here. And to Council Member Combs's point, in particular when we're focused so much on housing today, there is a tendency of housing to push out industrial space, and if you run out of industrial space and have to create more, that shifts your general plan around as well. So I'd like to make sure that we have sort of an understanding of those components. Uh, I also, uh, and I assume that there's going to be some discussion about additional layers that come into this as well. For example, we know we have uh, priority development areas, we know that we have the federal opportunity zones that whether intended or not, those designations are going to shift what types of uses are going to come into areas that may or may not be compatible with what we envision for the general plan and are largely out of our hands. So I'd like to understand a little bit better how those are going to shift how we are doing our plan uh, to account for it. Any additional questions? Ms. Fleming. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your time earlier today and going over this with me uh, briefly. One of the things that you mentioned during our meeting earlier in the day is that you had sort of, and I see this here in all hands on deck approach when you when we worked to annex Roseland, and that while people may not have gotten everything they wanted, they did feel heard. And what I'm particularly concerned about is what worked and what didn't work in terms of getting people to the table from all walks of life, in particular working families. This meeting we're having right now is at 4.32 p.m. or 4.37 p.m. At, at any rate, it's at, at a time when most people are, are working and I, I don't see too many people with small children in the room and, and will become annoying about it at some point, I'm sure, but 
help me to get people who are working families at the table in these conversations. And so I'm wondering if you have any specific plans to make it accessible for, for working folks to participate in, in a way that accommodates their, their work schedules and maybe perhaps unruly children. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> Um, yes, so that is a particular concern to us and something that we thought very carefully about when we did the Rosalind Specific Plan Project. Um, obviously, we can't control when council and commission those types of meetings are, um, but we, what we can control is when we do our workshops, when we hold our um, various events, pop-up events, um, you know, meetings with stakeholders, those types of things. And so um, what we tried to do with Rosalind that worked really well was um, hold multiple of the same meetings um, at very various times of the day, various days of the week. Um, you know, sometimes it was on a Saturday in the morning, um, but, you know, it might have conflicted with soccer. So, you know, we held others, um, you know, during the week, after work. Um, so it was, we tried to, uh, provide for all of those different opportunities, um, but in addition um, to address, you know, the working families that have kids and other ob obligations, um, we did provide childcare at all of our, at all of our um, various events, which we would do for this process, and we also, also uh, provided when um, the meetings were either in the morning near breakfast time or at lunch or dinner time, we provided food, um, which was a, a huge benefit to those coming in. Um, other ideas that I know have been floated around for the specific plan process is um, creating a workshop that would involve the the youth and the younger kids, you know, getting them out drawing in their, their future. What do you see? And so have them draw something. So there's all kinds of different ways that we've used and, and new ideas that we're gonna be working towards to address all those issues. Thank you, and uh, you know, my daughter has made a list of things that I'm supposed to do too. Apparently, she's got a whole, a whole plan as well. Um, but one of the other things I was wondering about is I'm assuming that the technical advisory committee and the community advisory committee are gonna be unpaid positions, volunteer positions, and I'm wondering if there will be any specific outreach to make sure that we have people who are raising children at the table and how we're gonna make that possible. Um, so yeah, so for the Community Advisory Committee, we definitely want to reach um, a broad range of people so that as many different groups are represented. Um, for the Technical Advisory Committee, that is generally made up of technical experts that are either um, city staff members from various city departments or um, staff members from other um, local and regional agencies um, that support the city. So, you know, folks from our Public Works Department, people from the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, those, those types of folks are what make up the Technical Advisory Committee. And I also just want to clarify too, the Technical Advisory Committee and Community Advisory Committee that we've talked about tonight are focused on the downtown plan. Uh, we're, we, we're very early in this general plan discussion. This is the first time we've even talked about it um, in front of the council. Um, we have a ways to go. Part of it's just to, to see the idea, um, give the council a breadth of what, what's going to be involved. But all the discussions about how we do community engagement, what type of um, community groups, um, advisory groups, all that ha hasn't been decided. So um, that's still open for discussion um, down the road if we look at some of the steps. You know, we, we, we have a lot of steps to go. Um, but I think that these are the type of things that we'll want to bring up. And as the city manager mentioned during the goal setting, if we can determine that level of involvement, that'll help us understand the scope that we can bring back to you in terms of the resources needed to accomplish that. Thank you for your consideration of all these things. I, I believe that we share a similar vision in that when we have all kinds of different constituencies at the table, we have a much broader and more vibrant outcome. So thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I have a curiosity question, and it's based on my experience in the last time that we went through this process, and I don't remember um, city resources being an issue the last time that we did this. It probably was. It's always an expensive process. Is there a, is there a way or a value in doing what might be considered a general plan update um, light? Uh, where you target certain parts of our general plan that are really vital to, to spend a lot of time updating, but others that perhaps 
could be handled in a different way, whether they are touched on and not necessarily um, where, where, the, where the dive is not quite as deep, uh, where the, uh, where I'm, I'm just thinking about the resources, that we are stretched thin and general plan, general plan updates are not inexpensive to provide and take a great deal of, of time and energy and, and then they're very valuable. Would, uh, would in certain parts of this plan, if they were to be identified, would, would it be valuable or would it compromise the document too much in certain areas to go light in the deep in in the dive? The um, the level of effort, from my expectation, would be would vary amongst all the different elements. Um, because some are rather stable, for instance, potentially characterizing the environmental condition. We know pretty much where the flood zones are and, and that's not gonna require so much, but it's those areas that have changed and that have uh, resulted in, that are part of the sort of the critical changes in the community, such as the fire hazards issues, uh, we would go deep. So what I'm saying is in our scoping of this project, when we come back, and I imagine we would with our scope to get authorized part of the budget, we would, we would talk to that. We would say, these are the five elements that we have to dive deep into in order to reconcile critical issues that this community is facing now. These other elements can be touched lightly because substantial change has not occurred and we can just simply revise them to help to ensure that their policies are supportive of the most important issues we're trying to, to face. So I th when we say comprehensive update, that sort of um, rationing, rationing out of level of effort throughout the elements is, is part of the process. Any additional questions? Okay, move to public comment. First speaker will be Susan Hildreth, followed by Miles Burgeon. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council people. Susan Hildreth, again, uh, Interim Library Director uh, for the Sonoma County Library. And I'm excited to report that yesterday, just about at six o'clock or 6.30, the Library Commission meeting in your chambers here appointed a new permanent library director, Anne Hammond, who is coming from Lexington Public Library in Kentucky, but is a Californian and has worked in Alameda County and San Diego County. And I'm here with you today because I wanna pave the way for a successful partnership for Anne and the Sonoma County Library with the City of Santa Rosa and all of our other partners in the Joint Powers uh, Agreement for the future. I just want to remind you, and I'm sure most of you know this, but the library operates four facilities in Santa Rosa. You own three of them, Central, Northwest, and Rincon Valley, and we're also operating the Roseland Library, and we are committed to continuing the operation of the Roseland Library, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot about out in other meetings. But I just wanted to mention that when, when I hear the general plan, when I hear you talking about community resilience, that's one of the key services that libraries are providing to your community members. I want you to remember that and understand that we reach out to all stages at all ages. And we are here to help you in terms of this general plan process. And it's interesting when you talk about reaching out to communities that you don't usually reach. I think many of our users in our libraries are those folks. And we would be great facilities for you to have meetings because we have meeting rooms and we have children's librarians who could take care of the kids while we were having the, the sessions with the adults. So please uh, remember us to help in this process. And just as a, an aside, I, I was so interested in your quick discussion about the 3D printing and how that's affecting our manufacturing economy here in the US. And we have 3D printers at all the libraries. So if anybody hasn't had a chance to have a real interaction with a 3D printer, stop by your branch library and we'll, uh, we'll make that available for you. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like a road trip. Thank you for that. Uh, and please pass our congratulations on to your new director. And if she'd like to set up a meeting with me, I'd be more than happy to meet with her when she gets into town. Um, Miles followed by Terry Shore. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Miles Bergen from Southwest Santa Rosa. A lot has changed since the last time our general plan was updated in 2009. We heard from the presenters many of those issues. 
And with a changing set of problems with this, our solutions, I believe, should change alongside them, which is why I'm so happy to see the comprehensive update of our general plan is in store. But Santa Rosa is far from the only city facing serious environmental and equity problems, and I think it would make a lot of sense for us if we turn to other cities for inspiration and potential solutions. Specifically today, I'd like to talk about the city of Minneapolis. Bold in its proposals and broad in its scope, Minneapolis 2040, the recently enacted general plan, represents the type of visionary policy we desperately need here. Policy that recognizes the gravity of the problems facing us and meets them with equal vigor. And at its core, Minneapolis 2040 sets out to address these problems through the lens of economic and environmental justice. On climate, the city's plans shapes zoning code around existing transit lines, requiring higher density for both commercial and residential development and busy transit corridors. Additionally, it provides, prioritizes pedestrian friendly development, then bicycle development, then mass transit, and finally, um, the single family vehicle. And it's committing to this idea that if we're going to seriously address climate change, we need to reduce reliance on cars. And to do that, we need developments which makes that shift possible. On economic and racial justice, the city's plan addresses the history of housing discrimination and redlining, redlining head on by providing equitable access to quality neighborhoods and aims at an even distribution of affordable housing throughout the city. Not only does it mandate increased density around transit corridors, but it paves the way for increased density in single family neighborhoods as well. We've already started on this path through the ADU policies, but Minneapolis carries this further by allowing up to triplexes in all single family neighborhoods. This changing zoning allows mixed income development and reduces the harms of economic segregation. Similar policies here would ensure that all children have access to safe neighborhoods and quality schools, not just the children of parents who can afford to live in elite neighborhoods, and would go a long way to addressing disappearing economic mobility in our community. Minneapolis 2040 is a bold and visionary document, but it's also 1,100 pages long and a document to which I couldn't possibly do justice in three minutes. But over the course of the general plan update, I hope that the council and city staff not only reads it, but uses it as an inspiration to shape us into the type of inclusive, green, and equitable Santa Rosa we all deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Terry, followed by Deborah. Uh, good evening, um, Mayor Schweighelm, staff, members of the public. Um, Terry Shore, Regional Director, uh, Greenbelt Alliance. Um, first, I would just um, urge the City Council to please consider a comprehensive update of the general plan um, in your goal setting um, happening in February. Um, I really appreciate the outline that was provided that emphasizes the importance of public engagement, the importance of a uh, robust CEQA process, the addition of the environmental justice element, and um, uh, the, um, the comment about the regionality of what we're doing here with the general plan, because the Sonoma County general plan is also going to be updated, and several other cities are now updating their general plan. Um, I would also um, like to thank the council members who've already made some very um, interesting comments and questions that I hadn't heard of, so I think there's a lot that we can do. Um, we're going to be facing a lot of disruptive changes in the next 20 to 30 years that I have no idea how you will fully address in a general plan, so I think that we do need to think about that um, as we move forward. Um, there are several specific um, policy areas that Greenbelt Alliance would be interested in participating in. Um, I heard reference to um, fire risk, and uh, we'd like to participate in um, uh, the consideration of fire safe land use um, principles. One thing we might want to put in there is a framework or a mechanism for transfer of development rights, not only for fire risk, but maybe for flooding or for some other um, issues such as California tiger sand salamander, if we could move the development rights out of that habitat into the downtown area or somewhere where we do want to develop, so maybe at least have a mechanism in there, even if it's not funded. I'd like to see an emphasis on cl climate change and updating the action plan and making that part of the, um, the housing element, uh, a par part of the general plan, sorry. Um, also, um, the housing element is going to be coming up pretty quickly, you're probably already working on that for 2023, so that is something to consider going forward as to when that's going to start up. 
Um, and then just a couple other quick um, miscellaneous uh, comments, particularly um, related to um, public outreach. Um, that is very important. Um, Greenbelt Alliance would be happy to support you on that. Uh, we did a pretty good job when I was running community separators and doing a lot of countywide um, outreach. I did participate a little bit in the Roseland um, outreach, and I also heard that people were pretty happy with that. And one thing that I recall is that there was food. <laughs> so families who could come and they could have something to eat while they were there. So those are just a few thoughts, and perhaps you'll also consider us for Greenbelt for the CAC and the TAC as appropriate. Thank you for your comments. Deborah, followed by Peter Stanley. Thank you. Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net, certainly we're looking at a global disruption. I have friends all over the world that I communicate with. And uh, as far as a comparison for reaching out to other cities that are already going forward, I would recommend that you contact Google and how they're setting up their smart city in Ontario. Uh, it's met with quite a bit of disruption within the advisory meetings that have been held within Google because of the extreme surveillance and the lack of privacy that those cities will afford if they're built on the Google platform. Um, I also wanted to talk about the mention of um, safety and hazards, and someone mentioned earthquakes. What about the uh, geothermal plant up here that I found out was the world's largest geothermal plant that causes earthquakes, dozens of earthquakes every single day, right up here in the Mayacamas Mountains? How many people in Santa Rosa realize the number of earthquakes on a daily basis that injecting the wastewater treatment from um, from the treatment plant in Santa Rosa, 40 miles of pipe with booster pumps and injecting sewer, urine, poop, and pharmaceuticals that goes up into our atmosphere and creates acid rain, and along with the earthquakes. So I'm just concerned about how the public outreach is really occurring. Because I'll tell you something, I've lived here for 20 years, and I never really understood what was going on with Pacific Gas and Electric, which is AKA Rothschild, starting the world's largest geothermal plant right up here in Santa Rosa, only 45 miles from Bohemian Grove. But I just want to add that I'm looking at what is occurring throughout the world with the global disruption and the elimination of gas. Certainly, people here on the rebuilds are being incentivized not to use gas. We now see pg and &E, a.k.a. Rothschild, separating or wanting to separate their electrical and their gas division. Why? Okay. Uh, we've also gone up to the town of Paradise with uh, two ex-retired um, fire captains that between the two of them have 60 years of experience. It has been determined that the smart meters were part of the house-to-house -house ignition. And I think that when you look at your general plan, you ought to really take a look at what the smart grid has done, as well as all of the wireless smart water meters that are being deployed and all the increased frequencies. The environment has so much electrosmog, and the electromagnetic frequencies in the environment are highly combustible. We have been told by Cal Fire Chief when they met at a town hall in uh, the Commonwealth Club a few weeks ago that the entire country is going to be combustible, and it is because of climate control. Now, I told you earlier today about climate control, and I know I've, I'm getting a public opportunity right now, and I appreciate the limited amount Thank of you. public opportunity. Thank you. Thank Thank you for your comments. Peter, followed by Tom Conlon. Thank you, uh, Mayor Schwellhelm, members of the, con of the council. My name is Peter Stanley. I'm with Archaeologics, planning and architecture firm here in Santa Rosa. I wanted to just speak briefly about a potential, what I see as a potential technical um, speed bump in what we're talking about here tonight. I first want to say that I'm very impressed with what the city staff has done and the way they've brought policies forward in order to try and streamline and um, implement development strategies in the downtown and for Santa Rosa in general. That's been brought forward to the Planning Commission and then to Council. And all of these are fantastic and important parts of how we're going to get things moving here again. Um, what I wanted to talk about just very briefly was 
this potential disconnect that could happen when we have the specific plan who we're moving very quickly on, and I applaud that effort to move that in the next six to eight months, and the general plan that is following that in a three-month time, uh, three-year timeline, is that we could very likely have development potential in the downtown that fully meets the specific plan changes, these very aggressive but I think important changes that will happen in the specific plan that will be out of alignment with the general plan. And as we know, the general plan is the guiding document of the city, everything tears off of that. So I wanna make sure that there is some mechanism that we have as we implement specific plan first, general plan second, that we're not saddling development with having to go through general plan amendments for every little parcel that we try to develop in the downtown. And I've had this conversation with David and I know he's aware of it. I just wanna bring it to the attention of the council as well is that we think about that because that could be a potential speed bump when you have, for instance, height limits that may be um, changed or eliminated in the specific plan for the downtown area, but it's memorialized in the general plan and then we already have a disconnect that's going there. So I, th I suspect that the general plan will follow the specific plan. That's not typically how you would do it. You would do it the other way around. But um, just to keep that in mind and that, uh, find mechanisms as we go through this process to ensure that we don't end up with speed bumps, that we actually can start moving these projects forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Tom, followed by Thomas Ells. Hi there, Tom Conlon uh, speaking today on behalf of Sierra Club Sonoma Group. I'll keep my comments brief because we're just at the beginning of this process. I wanna welcome you all for undertaking this challenge to update your general plan. And I would agree with comments of, of uh, commission or of council that this is an opportun opportune time to be taking up your general plan. This will, this will be the first time you are undertaking a general plan update in the era of our new climate crisis. And the, this is an opportune opportunity to correct the deficiencies in your existing plan and to harmonize the, the climate action plan which was previously appended into your general plan. And an opportunity for us to really begin to think beyond just what we could be doing but to how are we gonna keep track of our progress and how are we going to enforce making sure we do achieve that progress, because if any city knows what the costs are, our city of Santa Rosa knows that. Um, I wanna also say that uh, we're very encouraged by staff's comments about this not being just a general plan update, but a, a rethinking of the plan. And we, we would support that certainly in the idea of having the plan be simplified for the use of the public so and, and for developers members of the community in general, so that it's not daunting and it becomes the domain of experts. It really does need to be accessible to the entire community to avoid the process that was just referred to our, by the last speaker who doesn't wanna have development projects have to go through a cumbersome rethink. I can't speak for every uh, Sierra Club member or every NIMBY neighbor who, uh, who might wanna use that third rail of CEQA to impose their vision of the world on, on the community's general plan. But uh, I can say that I know from my own personal experience that national, state, and local level uh, people in Sierra Club understand that we need to redesign our cities to get people out of their cars. And we, we think that this is an opportunity for the city of Santa Rosa to take that approach. And we at Sierra Club, will support you in that endeavor as we begin this general planning process together. So thank you for the time to make those comments. Thank you. Thomas Ells. Thank you and uh, happy new year. Um, well, general plans are, are the opportunity, as Mr. Conlon is saying, uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to look into the future. Um, general plan updates sometimes do have surprises. As was mentioned, uh, it's possible to consider or make notifications for general plan updates with that specific plan update so that it does actually update the general plan in the area that you're dealing with the specific plan. So that you can essentially update both of them, just be like a specific plan and a general plan amendment that you can do at the same time. Um, 
But the great danger that I would point out in a general plan update um, and the cause is of being blindsided in the future. So a broad look is really important. Um, for instance, uh, flood plans and flood plains assume a fixed datum at the sea level. Sea level rise is gonna change that both in Petaluma and even here in the Laguna. It's going to, it floods up into Todd Road, quite a bit up into Todd Road. And you'd be surprised what would happen if just one or two feet of sea level rise, let alone four or five. Within this planning period, there's gonna be significant sea level rise and there'll be some changes, hey Jim. Um, fire hazard mitigation, very important. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out the last mile commute uh, that we have a challenge to get people to, as circulators to, so it was discussed before with the bus, but, but um, getting people to smart train, I would like to see conceived of an elevated circulator that we can talk about, and I, there's, I don't see any way, for instance, with sea level rise in water, um, uh, to do what uh, Elon Musk is doing in Los Angeles, was to dig something, or in Mumbai, now they're digging a big, giant, uh, enormously expensive subway they're putting in. Uh, those kind of things probably wouldn't work here, but we could have something elevated, very low cost, uh, but it would, help us greatly in the future, and I'd like to see possibly if we could look at that. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Running back to council, any uh, additional comments about the presentation? Seeing none, I bring it back to staff. Did you get the information that you needed from council? We did, thank you very much. Right, and I really want to appreciate, I appreciate the presentation, and Andy, your comment about it's not about no, but about how really resonates with me, so I like the spirit of that moving forward. That is gonna be a great, multi-year plan, so thank you for the presentation. Thank you. All right, we'll now move to the regular city council meeting. Uh, Madam City Clerk, shall we do another roll call? Let the record show that all council members are present. Uh, Mr. City Manager, we'd like to report on the study session that we just studied. Uh, nothing additional to add. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, uh, would like to report on the closed session. Yes, the council met in closed session and took no action, uh, gave direction to staff. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have no proclamations. Mr. City Manager, do we have a uh, staff briefing? No, not this evening. I, I, um, I'll, I'll say my comments for my session, but not this evening. Thank you. Moving on to the city manager's report. Did you have a report you'd yeah, like to Yeah, I make? just, I wanted to um, uh, make council aware that we are uh, currently analyzing um, what, what the impacts of the federal shutdown um, to um, city operations. I am aware um, that um, the, the, the DRCs um, where a lot of our paperwork is processed for recovery are basically not considered essential. And so um, our paperwork as it relates to public assistance has um, essentially stopped moving. Um, these are the types of things, so it's gonna be a longer process. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the implications of that are right now. We're gonna be looking at it, but that's just an, one example of what's, what's taking place with the federal shutdown. I'm sure there are others and I will share those with the council when I get a better understanding of what, what those impacts are. Thank you. Um, Madam City Attorney, any report? Uh, no report this evening, thank you. Uh, statements of instantia by council members, might there be any? Seeing none. Mayor, council members, uh, reports. Who would like to start? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so as I mentioned very briefly uh, earlier, I had a chance to be up in Sacramento yesterday for the inauguration of our new governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, and I thought it was would be kind of a nice way to start the year by uh, reporting back on some of the comments that he made specific to Santa Rosa. And one of the things that the governor said in his address that I thought was pretty incredible was that he wants the state, the legislature, and those 
who are working for him to attack the biggest problems that the state has, housing and homelessness, the same way that the people of Santa Rosa and Paradise and Ventura have attacked, have attacked their rebuild and taking care of one another. I thought it was a pretty great statement that uh, really says a lot about how our staff and our community has rallied around one another. It was nice to see it in a really important address for the new governor. Uh, it is the new legislative session. They did begin uh, prior to uh, the new governor being sworn in. And I want to draw attention to two specific pieces of legislation for this council uh, from members of our local delegation. Uh, both uh, members will be asking for support on these measures from the council, and I just want to put it on everybody's radar. First is ACA 1. That's by Assemblywoman Cecilia Aguiar Curry. This one actually included in it is a lower threshold for funding uh, ballot measures, excuse me, for ballot measures to pass to fund affordable housing in the local community. So for example, it would have lowered, in our instance, our housing bond to a 55% threshold to pass had this been in place. Uh, there are, as you know, a lot of political dynamics that come out when you have ballot measures uh, in election years and when you have legislation that affects ballot measures in election years. So I have spoken with the Assemblywoman and one of their priorities is going to be to put this forward this year when you can talk more about the substance of the policy and less about the politics. So they'll be coming back to us asking for some, uh, some help on that one. The other bill that I'll mention is by Assemblymember Jim Wood. It's AB 38. It's an act related to fire safety, and in particular, it, it includes up to a billion dollars for a low interest or no interest fund to help homeowners to make uh, home hardening and resiliency improvements in high fire severity zones, and to make it a requirement after a certain date that when a home in those uh, areas sell that they have to come up to compliance with the updated building codes for fire safety. So it's one that I know that our staff is going to want to be involved in and that the council is going to want to get updates on. I just wanted to make sure that I put that on everybody's radar. Thank you, Mr. Weissmeyer. Other members? Ms. Combs? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to do a, a quick update on the CASA Compact. Um, CASA Compact passed uh, the MTC, the Metropolitan Transit Commission, on December 12th and was signed there by um, Runner Park Council member who is chair of MTC, Jake McKenzie. Um, the ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments vote will be January 17th. That is chaired by Supervisor David Rabbit. Um, and the likely final signing ceremony for the compact will be on the 29th um, at the Beale Street address in San Francisco. Um, so we'll see what happens with the ABAG vote. Uh, it's, a, it's a hot topic at ABAG. Um, it, again, reminding folks that uh, this compact uh, is supposed to represent uh, multiple sectors and interests sharing both responsibilities and benefits for solving our housing crisis. CASA being the Committee to House the Bay Area. It contains 10 elements. Um, almost all of these elements will need to go, to be passed regionally, will need to go through some kind of legislative action. It suggests establishing a regional housing enterprise to implement the compact. Uh, it asks to raise 1.5 billion from a range of sources to fund the implementation. It lists interest in expediting approvals and financial incentives for particular housing types. Uh, it reforms housing approval processes in ways similar to the ways that we have been discussing in our city. Um, minimum zoning near transit, it sets minimum levels for zoning near transit, increasing density basically. Removal of some regulatory barriers to additional dwelling units are similar to our own ADU policies. Um, it includes an emergency rent assistance and access to legal counsel provision, an emergency rent cap provision, and a just cause eviction policy provision. So those 10 provisions are moving forward as a single package toward the legislature who is taking them separately. 
<laughs> so we will see what happens. Uh, and I will keep you posted on the process and progress as these go through. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fleming? Hello, I'd like to take an opportunity that I missed uh, when I was seated a few weeks ago to let you all know a little bit about what I'm doing and, and the, how grateful I am to be here. I ran uh, for Santa Rosa City Council because I deeply care about making sure that in 20 or 30 years my daughter can afford to live here and not in my house. <laughs> I see that our middle class, our middle class jobs and our middle class way of life have been eroded and that there's some real possibility of a policy that we've been touching on here together this afternoon and that we'll continue to work on together to make Santa Rosa an affordable, livable place for, for all of our future generations because I, I don't plan on traveling to see my grandchildren at the holidays. So um, that having been said, this wouldn't have been possible without the help of um, a few significant groups. Uh, mo a lot of, I'd say most of my support came from North Bay Labor Council, the building trades. If I had to name every organized labor group that supported me, we'd be here all night and, and I'm guessing that that's not do you guys want to stay? Oh, no? Okay. So anyway, um, also I want to say that, uh, that the cannabis industry has supported me and um, be very upfront with you about that. Additionally, I got support from the Sierra Club and Sonoma County Conservation Action. Those three constituencies you know, really made it happen. And there's a few people in particular. Tony Giraldi walked and walked and walked and walked, even when I couldn't walk. Maddie Hirschfield showed up and filled in the gaps. My, my consultant, Dan Mullen, was amazing. And my, um, and my uh, campaign manager, Manza Atkinson, was also fantastic. I pulled out this drawer and I saw the names of Susan Gorin and Aaron Carlstrom and Julie Combs, a number of women who I was proud to be endorsed by, and were a small group of people who've sat at this dais. So I look forward to uh, that changing and, and having a lot more female companionship on the dais in the future. Um, I also really want to thank my daughter and my husband for giving up countless hours and continuing to give them up in return for this awesome um, responsibility and opportunity opportunity to serve. And um, also my parents, they made meals. They made a meal train. I had family in Washington, Oregon, and Colorado who came out for me and did just amazing work. So I look forward to earning all of the support from each and every one of you, whether or not I got your vote and whether or not you're in my district. Especially want to thank Mary Watts and Dorothy Beatty for running a really above board clean campaign. And I look forward to working with them in whatever capacity they're interested in. Thank you, and I'll try not to make too many more speeches. Thank you. Any other reports, Mr. Alvarez? Thank you, Mayor. I, I mentioned briefly uh, the downtown subcommittee uh, meeting from last week. Uh, next month, we're going to have a little bit uh, more in-depth discussion, recognizing that a lot of activity continues on in the downtown, uh, a lot of good things. So we want to kind of look into the future, see how we can be more engaged as a group, uh, and maybe kind of reformat some of the things that we have been doing. So I'll be, I'll, we will continue to report back on that. Great, thank you for that. Uh, in my report, I would like to announce my um, boards and commission uh, announcements or appointments. Um, I haven't made all of them, but for the planning commission, I'll be appointing Jeff Okrepke. For the Board of Public Utilities, we're appointing Bill Arnone. Art and Public Places, Monica Bryant. For the Board of Community Services, Terry Griffin. The Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, Christine Dector. Design Review Board, Eric Goldschlag, and for my Community Advisory Board members, uh, North Representative is Cecile Querben, and the at-large representative will once again be Vince Harper. Uh, and Deborah, I see you have two cards. Um, there were not reports made on 9.1 or 12.1.9, so if you wanna make comments on that, I would encourage you to do it on item 15. So moving to uh, approval of minutes, were there questions and or uh, Madam City Clerk, we had some corrections to the December 18th minutes? That's correct and they've been made. So has everyone had a chance to review them and are there any additional corrections? Ms. Fleming? I think I ought to abstain from this one. I don't think I mentioned that, right? Well, I believe you're there, right? The full minutes or, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's your call. But okay. Any uh, 
Additional corrections, nothing. Okay, we'll assume those as submitted the corrected version. Consent calendar, Mr. McGlynn. Item 14.1, motion approval of the 2018 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant application. Item 14 point resolution two, resolution second amendment to general services agreement number F000656 with IPS Group Incorporated Parking Meter Services and Supplies. Item 14.3, ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa admitting title 20, of the Santa Rosa City Code adding section 20-16.120 one-time automatic 12-month extension for tentative maps and associated entitlements to address housing needs within the city following the Tubbs and Nuns fire of October 2017, file number REZ1H-012. Thank you. Council, any questions on the consent calendar? Ms. Yeah. Combs. Yes, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to note that we have provided you with an amended resolution on item 14.2, which is the second amendment to the general services agreement for meter services and supplies. Um, the amended resolution simply states that the council is waiving any potential Re, uh, requirement for competitive bidding as was stated in the staff report and this simply puts it also into the resolution. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with respect to 14.1, I just want to ask, my recollection was we had a presentation on uh, the policy for drone use, and this is to, assistance grant is to be used to purchase drones. I'm just wondering if we've seen the final policy for drone use. I, I just don't recall, and so I'm asking. And if we did, is it posted online for others to be able to look I'll, at? I'll, I'll get back to you on the specifics. I believe that was the final policy, but I want to I want to confirm that with staff and and make sure that I will recirculate have that recirculated. Council okay, members. I'd like to see it again, and I want to make sure it's available online since we're a in the absolutely of purchasing. Thank you. Any other questions on consent? Do we have any cards for consent calendar? Vice Mayor Rogers. All right, I will move items 14.1 through 14.3 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. Mayor? Um, the light is out and I'm not or, well, it's showing, it's showing that it's Fleming. the mayor. Fleming and Sawyer are not in the right oh. order. Did you catch that, City Clerk? Yeah. I do often confuse you two. <laughs> and we have I, six I got eyes. I glasses. I think I recommend it for you. <laughs> with Council Member Fleming uh, not voting. Away from the desk. Thank you. All right, moving to item uh, 15, public comment on non-agenda items. Do we have any cards? Yes, we do. So I'll start with uh, Deborah. Did you want to make comments on these other two items? Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is for all that are listening at home to the recording because you're not gonna hear the facts here before you right now. I would recommend everyone do some research on who Ernst, Ernst and Young is, the uh, London-based uh, firm that the city has hired an accountant, a disaster consultant um, participant for. Uh, it is extremely important to understand who Ernst & Young is. They are a global organization, and they are in the process of collateralizing and increasing revenues for all cities throughout the world on capital, resource capital. In other words, coming up with fees to raise taxes on all of us for the um, aspect of climate change and the assaults that we're all experiencing through climate control, which is literally hiding behind climate change, is, is climate control. 
Having said that, I also want everyone to know that 100 resilient cities, of which Santa Rosa and many cities are members of, if you type in 100 resilient cities, you'll find that that is funded and backed by Rockefeller and all the major corporations. Now, I know this might sound crazy. It is crazy. It's crazy. And um, so I just want to point this out. Also, I didn't have an opportunity to talk about water, um, but I wanted everyone to also look up primarywater.org. Understand that very, very soon you're going to have mass restrictions and reductions of water accessibility. And uh, water is a renewable. It is not a finite resource. Everyone needs to learn the water facts. Sadly, we've only been taught about rain and snowmelt. Actually, rain and snowmelt is the evaporation of primary water, which is where geysers spray up out of the ground forever. Beautiful waterfalls cascade down from the tops of the mountains in the Hawaiian Islands and elsewhere in oases. Where does that water come from? Well, it surfaces from down below. When the process of hydrogen and oxygen come together, that creates water. In fact, we discovered on our tour of the world's largest geothermal operation right here in our hills that does cause those earthquakes I mentioned earlier, that they've tapped into primary water. And I don't know if you're aware of that. You should, because as a city, you may want to uh, bring another pipe down from that facility and add to your water supply. You can actually increase your overpumped aquifers and enhance those overpumped over aquifers with um, primary water. So again, I'm, I'm here as a public person uh, trying to uh, advise people what is real. It's certainly not coming from here. Thank you. Deborah Tavares with Stop the Crime. Thank net. you. Gregory Fearon, followed by Elizabeth Nealon. Actually, I don't think I put it in for general comments. I had one on uh, your earlier uh, general plan update, and then I wanted to make a comment about the, uh, the citizen engagement portion. So if you could hold that over for the report on citizen engagement for the downtown area station plan, that's where I wanted to put my comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, followed by Robert Kumparak. Howdy there. I'm Elizabeth, and I'm one of the leaders of the new Raging Grannies of Sonoma County, and my two friends, Karen and Jetta, are gonna sing with me today. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Go ahead. From this country we see justice leaving For the aging and poor in our land For the laws now are changing to profit The rich and the big businessman Come and stand up for what you believe in Blast business and government out of bed. The sick should have care, the homeless shelter, and the hungry receive daily bread. Now this We're not doing is... Those. We're going on to this one here. That's half the song. We're not going to do the rest. Thank you. <laughs> but our second song is ready. One, One, two, three. When, when justice, justice rules instead of guns. Dun, 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 dun. When, when justice rules instead of guns. Dun, 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 dun. How we want to be in that number. When justice rules instead of guns. When air is clean dun, dun, dun. and water pure. Dun, dun, dun. When air is clean and water through how I want to be in that number when air is clean and water pure. 
When housing is da, 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 a right for all. Da, da, da. When housing is a right for all. Da, 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 da. How I want to be in that number. When housing is a right for all. When health care is a right for all. Da, da, da. When health care is a right for all. Da, 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 da. How I want to be in that number. When health care is a right for all. When immigrants da, da, da. receive respect. Da, da, da. When immigrants receive respect. Thank you. Uh, Robert, followed by Thank John you. Walfall. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Uh, I stand before you as a uh, concerned member of the community. Uh, I am a local resident and a business owner, and uh, I think I am probably best known right now as Lucy's dad, the dog who has been missing for uh, roughly 41 days since she was stolen from our home in downtown Santa Rosa. Um, the reason I stand before you is that this incident has brought about uh, some awareness on our behalf of an issue that we've overlooked for far too long, which is a business that we believe is out of code and conducting not only illicit uh, transactions in the form of prostitution, but also engaging in human trafficking. And I have recently filed a complaint with the Code Investigations Department as recommended. Uh, and I stand before you really seeking your guidance into how to pursue what we believe is an issue that we've overlooked for far too long that contributed to the element that may be responsible for the disappearance of our loved one. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, John Walfall. There you go. It's all done. All right, hi, I'm a, I'm a relatively new resident to Santa Rosa, uh, though I've been in California for quite a while, raised my family down in Livermore. Um, one, I'm really here to address uh, Councilman Sawyer. I'm in District 2. Uh, I live, I bought a home uh, right across the road from Mount Taylor Park. Uh, I, I just recently moved back from Colorado. I bought there because it's a, a beautiful, right across the road from a, a open space area, parked area, and now I've kind of been appalled to find, as I walk the road there, Kiwana Terrace, that it's receiving very little uh, to no uh, upkeep with respect to people are dumping. Uh, there, are, uh, there has been for the last month uh, someone living in a trailer. I'm not too sure about the sanitary conditions associated with that. And I wanted to appeal to the council here is that, you know, you have a, a very nice public use area uh, right along that Kalana Springs Road is the uh, Frisbee Golf, which uh, I don't really participate in myself. However, I've noticed it's got a lot of use. Uh, there's cars parked along that road at all times. Um, so I believe it, it, it could use some attention both in the way of uh, services to keep the area clean. There is a creek bed that runs along that area. I was just there yesterday. I have some pictures with me on my phone. There was televisions in the creek. There was trash dumped along the area. When I take my case to the park, they're telling me, well, that road is, is a city road, so it's not up to us to clean. And when I call the city, they're like, oh, call the, uh, um, city, I forget what it is, community services or something. Uh, so it's really not receiving much attention. And then with respect to, I understand we have a homeless problem and, and the empathy that we wanna show to, to try to get these folks rehomed, but to have people pull up into this public use area, park a camper. I have called the uh, police department on a number of times and was told, well, we really can't do anything about it. It's not a crime to be homeless, which I agree with. However, if we allow this public use area to become open parking for, um, you know, folks that, are, that, are, that have, have campers and need a place to park them, it's gonna dissuade people from using that area. Anyway, that's it, I see I'm near done. Hopefully, uh, if I can find a way to get in touch with John Sawyer, I would like to, 
talk further on this. Thank you for your comments. Moving on to report items, and we don't have a city manager, but we do have an assistant city manager who's tactfully and deftly descending the stairs. Item 16.1 is a report item community engagement strategy for the downtown stationary specific plan update and Jessica Jones will be uh, kicking this off. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words before I hand this over to Patrick Streeter, our senior planner, who's going to be uh, managing this project for us. Um, as we have already discussed this evening, um, city staff and the council and everybody is um, very aware that community engagement is a key aspect to the uh, downtown stationary specific plan update. Uh, this is the, it's the cornerstone of the project and we would not be able to move forward with the project without it. Um, when thinking about the engagement, as we started to talk about this project even before we got the grant, um, what we really kind of were looking at as a base for community engagement was what was done, as was mentioned earlier, uh, with the Roseland specific plan and annexation. Um, there was a concerted effort with that process to go above and beyond what we typically do with our uh, planning engagement processes. Generally, you know, with a typical planning process, you would see community workshops and not a whole lot more. Um, and there was a, an effort to go far above and beyond that to really, you know, talk directly with residents, business owners, property owners, tenants, um, everybody that is affected in the community um, by the the proposal that's going forward. Uh, we knocked on doors, we held uh, neighborhood meetings in people's backyards, we went to businesses. Um, you know, it was really about talking one-on-one -on -one and, and going to all of the um, key stakeholders that um, would want to be part of this process. Um, so we really took that as a base in looking at this process and would like to go above and beyond that. So that's really what is before you today in the community engagement strategy is, is taking that and, and trying to go farther. The other piece of this is the development of the community advisory committee, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and one thing that I think it's important to make clear is that um, while the community advisory committee is a group that is required by the grant for this process, um, um, it is, and it is a council committee. Um, it is a committee that really is designed to be an ambassador for the project and help us with our community engagement, to really help us to get that word out and talk to others and get them involved, um, people that we may not be able to reach. So this group will not be getting any additional information beyond what everybody else is getting, um, but they're there to help us get that information out. Um, we're gonna be asking the council to waive a council policy on development of the committee, which is a similar process and the same process that we asked the council to do for the development of the same uh, group for the Roseland specific plan. Um, Patrick will go through the specific reasons for that. It was a um, very well received process for Roseland and it went very well. And so we anticipate the same here. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick for more information. Thank you. So we are back talking about the downtown station area specific plan update. Um, the focus for this item is the community engagement strategy. And I know I provided the council with some background earlier this evening, but for the benefit of those in the audience, um, we do have a downtown station area specific plan. It was adopted in 2007. And the purpose was to guide development in anticipation of the downtown smart station opening. Uh, we are halfway through the plan period and we are far below the projections of, um, of development that was envisioned in that plan. Um, probably the most starkly uh, below is, is as far as residential development where there were approximately 35 or 3,400 units envisioned and we have 100 units that have been built in that, that time period. Earlier in 2018, the council made downtown development and downtown housing a tier one priority. 
In response, the city applied for and received a grant from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, or MTC, um, and that grant is to provide an update to our station area plan. So it's one strategy in a, a, a series of several initiatives that we're taking for downtown. One of them is the update of this plan. And in November, uh, the the city contracted with Diet and Batia, who's an urban plan, urban and regional planning consultant firm, to assist the city in the preparation of this plan. Um, two of the the main components of this firm's presentation that appealed to the city were the aggressive timeline and the fact that it was a feasible but aggressive timeline, but also that it included uh, robust and innovative outreach. That uh, is a main pillar of this update is the, the outreach and engagement. And we felt that this firm, um, building off of the successes that we've had with Rosalind that Ms. Jones has talked about previously, um, would also be able to, to build off of those, those learning experiences and, and what we consider to be a successful engagement to, to bring that even broader this time around. Um, we have uh, Steve Kansian with Shared, uh, Shared Spaces, um, who is the sub-consultant that will be helping us with that community engagement. And um, after my component of this presentation, I'll hand it off to Steve and he will go further down with uh, the specifics on, on how we're gonna approach engagement uh, moving forward. So as was mentioned previously, the downtown station area plan area is uh, much larger than just the vis immediate vicinity of the downtown station um, or even just the, the downtown core. It involves several single family residential neighborhoods as well as commercial districts and industrial districts. This um, plan is going to vary slightly from the original plan in that we're extending the plan area to the east out to Brookwood Avenue. Um, that'll be consistent with our downtown uh, core as defined in the general plan. It also lets us take advantage of the proximity of within walking distance of the transit mall in addition to the smart station. So we're adding more transit options to the plate as we look forward in this, this development pattern. And so with that, I'll hand it off to Steve to, uh, to go a little further into the specifics of the community engagement strategy. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. So first, I just wanna say, to the mayor and council members how excited we are as a team led by Andrew, our project manager from Diet and Batia, to have an opportunity to help the city realize the vision. It's been so clear to us as we've sat in the room for the last several hours. It's really exciting to hear how much commitment there is recognizing that not everyone has the same vision, but that people really want to come together and make something happen, because none of us are in the business of writing plans. We hope we're in the business of helping communities really improve, and it's really it's exciting to start knowing that that's where everybody is together. Um, having had the chance to work with Jessica and many of you on the council on past community engagement efforts, um, we're excited to build on the successes of Roseland and also the lessons learned, because it certainly wasn't perfect, and to try to set a new standard for what the community can expect when together we make a plan here in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, we know that's particularly important because downtown is thousands of people's home already and thousands of people's place of work, but it's also all Santa Rosa's center and as someone who had the pleasure of being born at Santa Rosa General, I mean, I remember coming to downtown a long time ago, and my grandma's farm was out on Guerneville Road, so at the edge of town, but this is still everybody's center. So we have an added challenge, how do we reach everybody while respecting the neighbors? And then we also recognize that one of the constituencies are people who don't even know yet they wanna live here but we want them to know that in the future. So how do we include them so we actually speak to the future residents and future workers we want? Um, and that's a, a challenge, but one that we're really ready to take on. So I wanna mention three key elements of what we think would be an effective engagement plan um, briefly, and then as much as possible, both answer questions, but also get input because as council people and as active members of the public, everybody here has experience in community engagement and this is literally the first meeting of the effort for us. So we really wanna be here with open, open ears. So the first thing we, we really learned in Rosen was you can't ask people to come to the project, you gotta bring the project to people. Um, and so the, our plan in every way seeks to bring the project to where people already gather. 
So at a first level, that's the meetings that already exist in town. And whether it's Los Cien or whether it's teens at the CHOP Center, wherever people meet and gather, we will be doing pop-up outreach to bring it directly to them. Um, and the, we also recognize that people don't necessarily meet in person. Um, so we want to fully engage social media, but not only putting information out, we want to create virtual workshops and virtual discussions online so people can participate in planning digitally if that's how they engage socially. So it's not only where people are physically, um, but it's also where people are socially. How do they interact? How do they have input in their lives? We need to be in that same space. And because this plan has a diversity of constituencies, some of those places might not be where we usually plan. Like maybe we should have a pop-up workshop at the 4th Street Deli, and you get free potato chips if you give input on the plan. Right? Or we should be at the, the Hilton in the morning and you get a cappuccino if you tell us what, what brought you to Santa Rosa and what would bring you back. We've got to go to where the, all these different constituencies are. And then lastly, while we say not just workshops, we certainly do want to engage people as co-planners and your members of council because you know deliberation is important. So we will and need to have both workshops and a CAC so people can deliberate together as well as have an open door. The second key element is a fully representative CAC. Um, and as Jessica rightly pointed out, not to make decisions, but so that everybody knows they have an ambassador to and from the project. And so between the events and all those times when people are like, well, what's happening next in the project? It's been two months since the last workshop that everybody knows they have their person. So as you've seen in the proposed plan, we want every council district to have a representative, every neighborhood in downtown, property owners, both commercial and homeowners, but also renters, um, all demographics, uh, people who own businesses, people who own the buildings where businesses are, and then maybe somewhat unusually, the prospective resident or prospective business owner um, so maybe we go out and have a workshop at the lunchroom um, at Keysite. People we'd love to have live downtown, but aren't yet. Um, and so that it's critical, and one of the reasons Patrick will explain, to have an open-ended um, process led by staff to select the CAC is to make sure we can nimbly find all the right people and bring them together, and that will probably change over time we're not gonna find every single person on day one, and we wanna be able to make sure it remains fully representative. So if we're reaching everybody where they're at and we have a fully representative CAC, the third thing we learned is just like church or football, the, the church of football, if you're a football person, you gotta start the games at the same time every day and have it be the same day every week. So we need a consistent rhythm of the process so you saw on the plan that we have, and if you go to the, the slide with the plan, we have, have very intentionally a clear rhythm to the project. So you'll see through the center there, we've got four phases, a deep dive on opportunities, developing alternatives, and then creating first a draft and a final plan. Um, we're in the crosshatch box in the upper left-hand corner. That's where we start the very first meeting. So during be below the line as the foundation of the project, during each phase, there's pop-up outreach, meaning taking it right to the 4th Street Deli. There's a CAC meeting and there's a workshop. And that happens at each stage. So you're getting each level of engagement at each stage. Similarly, above the line, we're engaging both the planning commission and council um, at each stage of the process. And as I think the mayor mentioned earlier, this isn't, just because we want people to feel like they're engaged, it's because the end product isn't just a plan, it's a community that's come together and wants to implement the plan, and that you need that community behind you to do the hard work to actually make the plan a reality. Um, so we see this community engagement not as a, a means to create a plan, but rather as a means to improve downtown by bringing the community together to implement a plan. Thank you, Steve. 
So essentially what we are asking of the council tonight is to provide guidance on the community engagement strategy. So we've provided a draft community engagement strategy. Um, and so we'd, we'd ask your guidance on how you'd like that to move forward. Um, and additionally, we are asking for the waiver of council policy 0006. And um, as Jessica had mentioned previously, this is it's not unprecedented. We did it for, for Roseland, and it provides a more flexibility in, in implementing this strategy. So the, the council policy does exist for a reason. It's to create a structured way of forming subcommittees um, that ensures that we have the proper stakeholders. Um, the council policy requires that they be residents of Santa Rosa. Um, also that they're properly vetted. They have to go through the council and the, co the council then selects the members of those committees. So the reason that we're asking for a waiver of that policy in this case is that it's a broader engagement than just existing residents of the city. And we also, as council member Sawyer had pointed out earlier, we're looking for ways to avoid log jams. One of those would be having to set up council meetings to, to go over the list of potential members of these committees and vet them through the council. Um, we will be doing the monthly report outs to the council through the, the downtown subcommittee. So that's a way that the council will be, state, will be kept informed of the, the meetings that the CAC has as well as the technical advisory committee committee and the general public meetings, in addition to meetings that are held in front of the council. Um, and so with that, the Department of Planning and Economic Development is recommending that you accept the community engagement strategy and also that you waive council policy 0006. Um, as I mentioned, we have members of Planning and Economic Development present. We also have Stephen Andrew from the subconsultant. Jason Carter with the Office of Community Engagement is present as well. Um, and it will be a joint venture moving forward. So it's not just going to be PED that's working on community engagement. We're going to be working closely with the resources that we have from our other departments as well. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. Vice Mayor Rogers, questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I wanna really uh, praise the pop-up outreach events that you have in here. Uh, we've talked a lot about that kind of engagement uh, at the Open Government Task Force and through other venues as well. And I personally, I do uh, monthly office hours that are out in the community and I can tell you when I tell people where I'm going to be, I might get one person. But if I go to something like the Wednesday night market, you have much more uh, level of engagement for folks. So I really am a big fan of that type of, uh, uh, of, of an approach. Uh, in particular, reaching out to uh, groups that have monthly meetings to do presentations or just to be there, whether it's Rotary or the Alliance or uh, the Young Democrats, young Republicans groups, and there's a whole bunch of self-organized groups, uh, Santa Rosa Together, that, that really I think could be engaged in this process as well and be integrated into that pop-up event approach. Uh, and so I hope you'll do that as well. One of my questions that I have for you uh, really a, is about the creation of the, the CAC. Uh, specifically, uh, I had an opportunity before I was elected to serve on the Roseland Area Advisory Committee. It was about, God, Gregory might remember, what over 40 people that were there, and it actually worked. And when I first went to the, the very first meeting, I thought there's no way that this is gonna work with so many people at the table. So why don't we just create the CAC and let anybody who wants to join, join? So, um it, it did work well. Um, there were some challenges, and one of them was because it was such a large committee. Um, with the Roseland Committee, uh, we did not have a cap on the number of uh, participants, which is different than what we're proposing here. We're trying to learn um, lessons from the past. Uh, this is a Brown Act committee, and so it is subject to a quorum. Um, and so trying to, number one, maintain a quorum when you don't always know how many committee members you have is difficult. Um, but we found it extremely difficult to uh, maintain a quorum um, when we had, it was upwards of 45 that we had on that committee and getting that many people, a quorum of that many people to actually come to the meetings was very difficult. So we had situations where we thought we were gonna have to cancel meetings. So we wanted to, we wanna make sure that we um, have a, a representative group um, that represents all the various aspects, but we also don't wanna have it so large that we run into that problem again. Okay, so if it's being brown acted, that means that 
even folks who are not officially on the CAC will still have an opportunity to be at the meetings to engage and to have their voices heard as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. It is a public meeting and, and we will be providing information on the days, times, and locations um, on our project website so uh, anybody can attend. Okay, if we are waiving council policy 000-06, does that mean that we no longer have a citizenship requirement for, participa for participation? That's correct. Great, thank you. Council, other questions? Seeing none, we have some cards here. No? Great, I love it when it works out that way. All right, uh, first, Speakers, Susan Hildreth, followed by Terry Shore. Well, good evening again. Thanks for indulging me. I just want to put my full support behind this community engagement process and offer the assistance of the library in any way possible. I'm hoping that as a partner agency, the Sonoma County Library might be considered uh, to be appointed to the Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, and we would love to work with you in terms of the downtown facility, which has all kinds of users that you're gonna wanna hear from uh, in many ways and just be uh, as helpful as we can. And just real quickly, uh, one of my former positions was a city librarian in San Francisco. And if anybody gets to to the Glen Park neighborhood. There is a great example there of a grocery store on the street level and a branch library on top of it. And something like that could happen in downtown. When I heard that grocery store, I thought, ah, we can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, followed by Gregory Fearon. Uh, Terry Shore, Greenbelt uh, Alliance. Um, Good evening again. I provided some comments earlier today on, on the downtown specific plan, so I, I won't repeat those, um, but just to say that Greenbelt Alliance generally supports the, um, the proposed uh, community outreach program. Uh, we will definitely be engaged and we would like to be considered for the community advisory um, committee. Um, and in any case, we will be doing outreach. We have connections with the environmental and conservation community and we often get asked to speak at places like Rotary. I have several um, you know, speaking engagements coming up and do get out quite a bit. So um, in any case, I will be helping to get the word out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gregory, followed by Daisy. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. Santa Rosa Together believes that healthy neighborhoods are necessary for healthy districts, and healthy districts are necessary for a healthy city. Continued community and city planning for districtization, specific area planning, or general plan updating all offer tremendous opportunities to take a deep dive into citizen engagement and partnership building. As you know, we are dedicated to citizen engagement. We might have a slightly different view of what that engagement might look like than what has just been described. Less assistance for implementation and ambassadorships and more actual advising. You've heard this afternoon that your staff has planned two complex and exciting initiatives to shape the city's future in the next three years. We urge you to provide the support for and demand the highest quality community engagement in both the downtown specific area plan and the general plan update. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Daisy? There you go. Hi, my name is Daisy, and it's Pisty Wine, in case you're avoiding saying it. Um, <clears throat> most people do, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> Daisy Pisty Line with Sonoma County Conservation Action. Um, I was watching earlier online, but was have been glad to see you guys um, moving forward on both the stationary plan and the general plan. Um, I was very deeply engaged in the stationary plan update in its first iteration a decade ago, and um, part of that was that both um, Green Metal Alliance and SCCA did a lot of outreach to the community on behalf of this plan. As Nick Caston commented earlier this evening, there was a lot of support. We had, I think, 150 people at the city council and 200 people at the planning commission for the 
for the station area plan update last time and they were generally supportive of it because they were excited to see density, transit-oriented development, affordable housing, green buildings, pocket parks and walkability and good integration of bikes and walking as well as transit and getting us away from cars. I am sure from the conversations I've had around this community and our canvassers out in the neighborhoods and what they're hearing from people that people are even more excited about that type of more urban style of development in Santa Rosa than they were a decade ago and we would love to ensure that the out reach to the community captures those voices, um, both of the younger generation who aren't able to attend daytime meetings because they're working, and as um, Victoria mentioned, folks who have young children at home. So we hope that you do structure the meeting schedule to include weekend and evening events, ensure that there's um, childcare available and food provided, and that you do it maybe at libraries or other places around the community that people are familiar with and feel comfortable coming to. Um, you might also look into incorporating um, text messaging or other forms of outreach to folks, or potentially doing like pop-up signs where people have the opportunity to text in what their comments are. Um, it's um, text is in is one platform that's been used. I think they got bought by someone recently, but there's a lot of innovation in civic technology and civic outreach that has occurred in the last decade that has allowed people to have their voices be heard even if they can't show up in person. Um, things like having this um, meeting, you know, screened online, where like I was watching it for the last few hours, but having a box saying, if you have comments, you know, send them to this address or to this email so that people can give comment, things like that. Um, and then we also will be more than happy to be spreading the word about these, this process and about the general plan through our canvas and you can be sure that we will be um, getting people out to support good policies in both of these. So um, look forward to talking to all of you about them in the future, thanks. Okay, thank you. And Thomas Ells. Thank you. I'm so used to being at the county where I get one minute or... Would you like one minute? <laughs> Potentially. Don't, don't toy with me, at Thomas. The, at, I know you're, you're so uh, facile with the minute. Um, we were just informed by a local architect about the potential for conflict between an updated specific plan and a general plan. If you update the specific plan and you don't update the general plan, when someone comes forward, they're gonna have to have a general plan amendment in order to do that. So I think you wanna have your notifications and your ducks in a row on that because that can take another 18 months on top of their project. Uh, certainly before they're getting any financing until there's a general plan update uh, for that uh, amendment. So I would encourage you to, whatever you have to do, to take care of that man's concerns, and I believe this is what would take care of that, uh, because we just went through the Roseland Village transfer from the county to the city, and they were well advanced on their plans in the subdivision within the county, and that all had to be redone again for whatever those reasons are. Um, and again, I would like to point out the potentially right here within the specific plan is you could look at a downtown elevated circulator. I am totally against autonomous driverless vehicles on the ground. Put them on an elevated circulator, you got a totally different thing. You can have autonomous vehicles on that, which would change all the dynamics of the costs and everything. Uh, really fantastic opportunity to include that in, a down, in, uh, in the um, downtown specific plan. So I'd like to do that. And of course, what if you were to what if you were to go ahead and propose that and try to start that without it might be in conflict with a general plan update? I don't, I, you know, that might also require a general plan update. I don't know. Thank you, Thomas. Bring it back to council. Any additional questions for staff? First, we'll start with Vice Mayor Rogers. Thank you, and it, it occurred to me, uh, one of the comments that I was gonna ask you about specifically is, how are you also educating the public about what exactly the master plan is, the general plan is, and what it actually means to their day-to-day -day lives? Because I think that part of where we're missing, whether call it civic education, is I'm not sure that folks always know what we're actually talking about. Do you have leading questions that you're going to ask that's going to get us to an answer that is usable for the development of the plan. 
So we we do have the existing conditions analysis, which is kind of putting together you know what plans are already in place, and so part of the the process will be educating the participants in this process about what what exists. And so not just what's on the ground and visible outside, but also what kind of policies are in place, and um, and you know what's what's eligible to be to be adjusted through this process, and what's kind of something that we have to work with in moving forward. And then if, if you want to give any specifics on how we're going to incorporate that into engagement. Um, just an example, and it would be something that we could, Chris, maybe to get a chance to talk about more. Um, I think, as Greg mentioned, to do real engagement, people need all the information and the tools. So part of our challenge, which is what makes it exciting, is to teach planning quickly, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to go to grad school in like 15 minutes. You know, but seriously, you know, what are what are the key constraints and realities? Because like if you ask someone, how do you want to redo your kitchen and you gave no parameters, you're not making a real plan. Right? And so you're not actually engaging people. Um, so we were talking, on, Andrew and I, on the way up, how do we distill the factors in an in, a, a existing conditions report and the different things that need to be balanced so we don't recreate the experience of the last plan where we put out bold projections, but they don't happen. And we need to share that with people, but still give them the, uh, the space to say what they really want. And that's the art in it. Um, not to close anyone down, but also to make sure that people are operating with all the information so they can uh, give us input on the real trade-offs, which is where they start to have real participation like Greg was saying. Yeah, and per perhaps we can uh, meet and talk about this a little bit more offline, yeah. but uh, if you ask most of my neighbors, what do they think of the downtown station area plan, you're gonna get a far different answer than if you ask them what issues are going on in your neighborhood and what do you want it to look like 20 years from now. 100%. Yeah, okay. so I appreciate that, and, and uh, I'll just really quickly to my, my comments. Uh, as. Councilmember Sawyer said earlier about breaking log jams. I'm also interested in breaking down barriers of participation. So uh, we talked a little bit about food and about child care. I asked the specific question about citizenship. I wanna make sure that the application doesn't ask questions like, are you over 18? Are you registered to vote? Are you a US citizen? Anything that would keep people uh, at any age who wants to participate, able to participate if they are a part of this community. Uh, and so that's a really important thing for me as we move forward both on this and on the general plan uh, update at large. And also, uh, Vice Mayor Rogers, if I may add, um, Andrew just uh, reminded me also a part of this um, this process will be having an online presence um, and also distributing educational materials. So one, one component of the website is that we do have an FAQ. So it, it has drop down lists for, for general questions that people may have so they can look up what is a specific plan? How is this different from a general plan? So, so people can do some of that self-educating as well. Great, and that'll be available uh, multilingual? Great. Right. Councilmember Combs. I think he just did it again. Um, I just want to confirm that I'm hearing <clears throat> good Spanish language material and inclusion. <laughs> okay. And um, when, when I first came to the area and someone started talking about a stationary plan, I thought they meant a plan that held still. <laughs> stationary. So we're talking people who, who are beginning in the process, we're talking really fundamentally beginning in the process, just like, I mean, I, I had a little background and still heard stationary, not stationaria. Um, so when we talk about land use planning, that phrase itself doesn't hold meaning. Um, I provided um, in the, in the meeting that I'd had with um, with David, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, an, a Nike ad that I wish I could display, but I don't have a mechanism for displaying it, that is written in the form of a public notice from city government, you know, opportunity to purchase, you know, <laughs> it's just, it, it doesn't have pictures, it's not your basic, it looks like, you know, any land use planning ad, no one would answer that ad. Um, so uh, also I wanna make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to develop and educate neighborhood groups. We've been really looking over at the community advisory board and at 
our community engagement at how we help neighborhoods build and develop. And there were some grants that came in to help neighborhoods build and develop. And I'm really hoping that we can use this process to develop and build the strengths of those neighborhoods um, so that they understand why to be involved in land use planning ideas. Um, if it's a Brown Act meeting, will it be required to allow public comment? So the public cannot just attend, but they will be, re we ha they will accept public comment. Yes, we, there will be opportunity for comment on any of the items that we're discussing there. And just like with council meetings, there'll be items to talk about other, uh, okay. uh, opportunity to talk about other items as well. And, and my colleague here rec sort of had a list of, let's be careful how we ask certain things so that we aren't um, missing, uh, embracing people coming forward and taking part by how we ask certain things. One of the things I would add to that list is not being gender binary in the responses. Thank you. Mr. Tibbetts, do you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. No, it was mostly a follow-up on what Councilmember Combs brought up relating to community engagement. I brought it up earlier just to reiterate that, you know, we do seem to have these strong neighborhood organizations or these groups that have roots in these different neighborhoods and to really utilize them as best as possible. And Councilwoman Combs' idea of, of grants, I think, is a good one or providing support staff. You know, I think one thing that our staff does so well is providing information, support, and a clear pathway forward. Um, I think it's always a struggle for any government entity to adequately and sufficiently do community outreach. I mean, I say that as somebody who had to do it on behalf of the county in my first job out of college. Um, so I would say the more you can specialize in what you do best and let other folks who specialize in outreach, uh, let them take the charge and, and you know, hopefully we get a lot of robust public input. Any other questions? Mr. Sawyer, you have this item? Um. Mr. Oh, Madam City Attorney. Yes, I just wanted to, if I may, um, we've had several comments tonight about the, um, the correlation between the specific plan and the general plan and the potential that they might be out of sync time-wise. And I just want to clarify for the council and for the public here that as we go through the specific plan, we will be making, we will be looking at the general plan and making any parallel amendments to the general plan as we go forward. That was how we um, we worked with the Roseland specific plan, so that at the final meeting when you adopted the specific plan, plan, you also at the same time adopted the corresponding amendments to the general plan. So there should be no um, uh, out of sync problem. Thank you for the input. Yes, nothing is done in a vacuum through these processes. Yes, and if I could just um, add on to that, um, in addition to bringing forward any needed amendments to the general plan to implement the specific plan, we will do that for all of our city documents. So our, our zoning code, citywide creek master plan, bike and pedestrian master plan, any documents that could potentially be impacted by proposed policy within the specific plan would also be amended. It will come as a package to the council. Great, thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce a motion to waive council policy 000-06 regarding appointees to boards, commissions, and committees, accept the community engagement strategy for the downtown station area specific plan update, and authorize the director of planning and economic development to appoint members of the community advisory committee as necessary. Second. Second. We have a motion, a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, your votes, please. I think we've got them lined up here, and it's a unanimous 7-0 vote. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Those of us on council, some of us and staff have been here since 1 o'clock, so we're going to take a brief 10 to 15-minute break. Thank you.
Do we need legal counsel? Mr. City Manager, please introduce item 17.1. 17.1, public hearing, density bonus ordinance update, Jessica Jones presenting. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'm gonna be kicking off the presentation here and uh, then we'll hand it over to Andy Gustafson who will go through all the specifics with you. Um, I just wanted to do a quick reminder of what the density bonus um, program is. Uh, we have our housing action plan as the council is aware. Um, the, an update to the city's existing density bonus program was listed as part of the housing action plan. It's within the program one, which is regarding inclusionary housing um, and the uh, guidance within the housing action plan for density bonus was to look at the state's existing requirement which is um, allowing up to 35 uh, percent density bonus so density beyond what is allowed in the current general plan um, and to look at going beyond that to up to a hundred percent density bonus to um, really help incentivize both housing in general but also so um, the affordable units that would be included as part of that density bonus program. Um, so staff has spent um, the last, uh, it's been over a year now uh, working on this program. We started it prior to the October fires. Uh, things got put on hold for a bit. Um, uh, but we came back, we held a number of workshops, which Angie, Andy will uh, be going over, um, heard from the community. We originally started citywide, um, but really ratcheted it back, um, again, which Andy will go into the specifics of. But really what this ordinance is trying to do is to um, uh, be part of the broader citywide effort to address the housing issues and the council's housing goals. So I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Thank you very much, Jessica. And um, during my presentation, if there should be any questions uh, of, of a staff, please feel free to ask. I have um, Milan Nevada with M Group who helped uh, craft the ordinance with us. And if we wanna dive into technical issues, he's available to help me out. So thank you. Um, so as Jessica said, we are recommending a update of the uh, city's current density bonus ordinance. Planning Commission has reviewed it and uh, is recommending that uh, the ordinance in the form that you have it is um, something that they support and, and would like the council to move forward with an affirmative vote tonight. Also accompanying this um, uh, ordinance is a CEQA document we prepared that looked at the potential uh, impacts of uh, the increased density in uh, primarily the downtown area uh, of, the, of the city. So first off, the, the, there are two major objectives with the density bonus ordinance. One is, is to bring it up uh, to compliance with recent state law changes that have occurred in the last five years. And I'll review what those are. Um, those are matters that are really aren't on the table for discussions because those are really, uh, it's really law of the land. And uh, we just want to incorporate those um, provisions in our ordinance to help facilitate local understanding of density bonus opportunities both at the state level and what we're uh, referring to as our local supplemental density bonus program. So that's the first objective is to get the state density bonus law into our code and the second is to implement a uh, or establish a supplemental density program that is uh, uh, furthering the goals of the housing action plan. This is a list of the variety of, of uh, state legislation over the last few years that has occurred on this matter. Um, you can see it topically, it, it extends from uh, extending the term of affordability to 55 years, uh, parking reductions, um, protecting replacement units that, that might uh, get redeveloped with a project, working towards streamlining processing, and also adding additional uh, types of development that qualify for um, 
uh, earning points or uh, eligibility towards density, including student housing. So the key provisions, um, and this now would apply anywhere in the city, is that housing development, meaning five or more units, uh, it would be eligible um, as, as of right. Um, so they would be um, allowed to increase density if a portion of those five units is affordable. Uh, 35 density, excuse me, 35% is the maximum amount the state would allow. Also there's, um, the provision of incentives and concessions, which uh, the developer can elect to help to uh, allow them to build this increased density. So those incentives and, and um, concessions might be reduced, setback, increased height, uh, and such. Um, the, we talked about increasing the, the term of affordability to 55 years. Uh, there's a lot more different, there, there are more types of specialized housing that are included uh, that w were not previously a part of the state's program. Um, and I think I've, I've mentioned the, the other items. Um, housing development can comply with a variety of different types of housing. Those are the ones that are bulleted there, not just lower income, units, but also senior housing, specialized housing, uh, um, uh, rehab shelters, shelters for kids, that kind of thing. Um, and condo conversions have been brought into the fold. Childcare, interestingly, now has been expanded as a, a means by which to qualify projects for density bonus. Um, it, and it also allows not just residential increase in intensity, but also commercial uh, businesses can increase intensity of commercial uh, square footage with the provision of on-site childcare. Um, the method of calculating the density bonus is the same. It's all based on tables. The level of affordability that's included in the project drives how much additional density you get. And these tables represent um, a sliding scale for each of the different types of affordability, very low, low, moderate income. And then also there's a provision that um, a developer might donate land at another location to allow affordable housing to be built if it cannot be accommodated in the project site. So those continue to uh, apply and are part of our ordinance and they're a key part of our ordinance. This is a calculation we included in the density bonus ordinance to help facilitate understanding how it's calculated. I might say not only for the developer, but for staff. Um, it provides a, uh, helps to assure a consistency and application of this um, rule. Um, this illustrates what a density bonus will do. So a density bonus allows a developer to uh, increase. Before you go on, yes. can we go back a slide? To, to the calculation or yeah, to Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you just sort of help me a little bit with that calculation? Okay, and I might be turning to Milan to help me. Um, so there's, there's, and I'm just, I should have asked this offline. I apologize that I didn't call and ask this offline. Page six has some like incentives or concessions numbers. Like it says, if you do 10% low income unit, 20% density bonus, that counts as incentive one. Right, it says that across the top of the chart. This is the first chart on the left. Yes. Um, so does that number one appear in this calculation? Oh. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how you use that. The calculation does not reflect or comment on the number of incentives that are granted. Um, that, that number, the number of incentives or concessions you get is based on the level of affordability that's included in the project. If we were to look back at the, um, the table at the lower left uh, for very low income, you can see that there's a break point between one concession and two yes. when affordability goes from 9% to 10%. Okay, and then 15% uh, you got gets a you a maximum of three. Right. So the, so so the calculation. Where are these used? I'm, Pardon? Just, I'm sorry, where are these used? How is this? So when we receive an application and a developer says they're electing to exercise a density bonus, we would then engage in a conversation around this, this math, if you will. We first identify the, the general plan land use designation 
allowable maximum density of development. And then we calculate based on the area, how many could units could be built on the site theoretically. And then we ask the developer, what percentage of affordability are willing to offer in the project? They may say 15%, in which case for that very low income group, um, they would be eligible for a maximum of 35% density above what the general plan would allow. And oh, by the way, you would get three incentives, you know, concessions if you need it. If, okay. if you so is the concessions list here? Um, the concession list is defined in the ordinance under the general provisions. So it's not in this packet? I mean, it is this, in the packet, It's yeah. in the full packet, but not in this presentation, so. Uh, it, it, no, but it is in the ordinance that you'll be adopting. Right, okay. We're it, recommending maybe, you adopt this evening, yeah. And maybe I can clarify that the concessions and incentives are, are completely separate from the percentage increase yep. of density. So you get the percentage increase in density, plus you get one, two, or three incentives, which right. might be lower, less setbacks, more height, uh, less open space in the... Right. Less I just wanted to make sure, I, I was trying to apply the numbers to the bonus calculation, and I misunderstood that I was not to do that, that that had to do with this other list of goodies that you could get, um, it, which I think is a good idea. I'm not... I'm not panning that concept at all. I just saw, for example, on page seven, it said density bonus desired, and there was an equation, and it had minus one, and I thought that was the one from, <laughs> so please forgive me, um, thank you, and I apologize again that I didn't take this offline. Um, so, yeah, so the, the calculation uh, will then, depending on affordability in our example here, um, this, these two bars represent a project that might be built and yield 51 units on a property uh, without a density bonus, but if they were to uh, incorporate affordable units on the property to the maximum that would be permitted by the state, they would get an additional 10, we would get additional affordable units on the property, but the overall development would go from 51 to I think it's 61. Uh, no, I do the math, 69, excuse me. Um, so that's, that's a significant increase in the number of market rate units the developer can build in return for providing uh, these additional uh, affordable units. Um, so that's the state's program, and that program's been in place for a number of years. It's, it's developers who are, um, who work in this area of, of housing know this formula throughout the state. When they come to our city, this is what they'll see and they'll know how to work through that, that formula. So it's a pretty straightforward exercise. Our supplemental density bonus is builds on that and when a developer comes in and chooses to maximize their state 35% bonus, they can go further under the supplemental density to increase the residential density to 100% in some cases above what the general plan would allow. So these, this slide shows what the criteria are to be an eligible supplemental density bonus project. So first, it's, you have to have a qualified or you have to have a housing development, five or more units. It, and we, we have, as Jessica mentioned in her introduction, focus a supplemental density program to the station um, plan area, which includes the downtown station plan, the downtown uh, station area, as well as the North Santa Rosa station area. And I'll show you a map here quickly too. So the gray area is both the downtown station area specific plan and the North station, North Santa Rosa station area specific plan together we felt, and, and with public input and, and planning commission um, recommendation, felt this was the best place where supplemental density can be supported. We have infrastructure, we have roads, there's an expectation for increased development here. Um, this is an area where we can roll out the supplemental density program and have a success, refine the tool. 
Um, so the other co important component is that it needs to be a part of a, um, a general plan designation where we anticipate higher density development. So, and then, um, then we have an entire program where uh, we require the developer to earn um, eligibility points with additional housing and community benefits, and we'll get into this now. So this is the, the gray areas where the supplemental density program is applied. It doesn't apply anywhere else in the city. Um, these are the land use designations which higher density development is already allowed in the city and um, we would allow supplemental density to be exercised within these land use designations, um, but not where uh, they might be located in a historic district, um, with the exceptions noted here. And I'll point out how there are certain zoning or land use designations near historic preservation districts where we can modify the supplemental density to help to ensure that increased development intensity does not impact historic districts, uh, the character of those areas. This map, and I apologize, the shading there isn't quite clear, but it shows eligible properties that currently exist with the appropriate land use designation where um, the supplemental density can be applied. And um, you can see that there are white out areas within these specific planned uh, boundaries. Those are areas that either do not have the proper land use designation or are within a designated historic district. So supplemental density cannot occur within those areas. Um, then the level of supplemental density will depend upon its the parcel's proximity to a transit station, a school, or an already designated housing opportunity site. When you have a property that's located near all three, you can have up to 100% density. As you have in properties that only have two of the three, it reduces down to 80%, or if you only have one of the three, it reduces to 60%. And in this way, we felt we were incentivizing increased densities within the supplemental density area where it's best supported by transit, schools, and where we've already planned increased housing. So we kind of incentivize it where we've already set it up to, to, to be located. Um, I want to call attention to, um, and I'm going to, uh, no, I'll just go back. Uh, the second column from the right in that table titled in medium low density land uses and B and C. This is our safety valve provision to help assure that a density bonus, supplemental density bonus project located on a site that might otherwise qualify to go well beyond what the state's 35% would be, uh, would not have an adverse impact on a um, historic district. So you can see here, we would allow an additional 25% bonus above the states for a total of 60% um, next to, in certain circumstances, a, a historic uh, preservation district. This provision was worked out in consultation with um, members of the public who expressed concern about that impact and also um, when we rolled back the uh, density bonus program to this uh, station specific areas, station plan areas, um, we, we included this provision as to uh, help to alleviate the potential impacts to other single family residential neighborhoods where the scale of development might be too dramatic of a shift and change in, 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 um, with the density bonus from the adjoining one and two story uh, single family dwelling areas. So um, the, the, the key thing to remember, go ahead. I, let me, I'm gonna put my foot in again, thank you. Um, um, so when we talk about 
the percent of total units in the base project required um, for this. When we do the bonus and they get 60% or 25% or something, those don't have to have the same percentage of affordability as the base of the, of the project. Is that correct? We'll look at the percentage requirements for the supplemental bonuses, but it, it builds upon the state's uh, density bonus tables. And I'm gonna turn to uh, Milan okay. to confirm that. I just wanted to make sure have I a slide. how many, what percentage, it, it, if you have 100 units and you get a bonus to 200 units, what percentage of the second 100 units are affordable? And we'll look at that okay. uh, shortly. It's coming, all right, I can, thank you. I can just comment on that briefly. So the supplemental bonus, as Andy was indicating earlier, is requires an applicant to have successfully qualified for the maximum bonus available through state law, which would be the 35%. In order to qualify for a state density bonus, you must pick one uh, affordability category. Even if you provide units at very low, low, moderate income, you can only pick one of those to qualify you for that 35%. Um, typically, only one of those is provided, um, but you must achieve that 35% by the provision of those units. So you're getting, let's say, a chunk of very low income units. That gets you the 35%. In order to qualify for the supplemental bonus, as we'll see in a moment with the, um, with the point schedule, you need to provide a spread of uh, units at different affordability levels. And that was tailored to the needs of Santa Rosa and the uh, community consultation that we did, as well as looking at housing needs in the city. There was a need expressed to have uh, units at multiple income levels, not just one. So there was, that structure is there to incentivize that. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, that we're incentivizing multiple levels of affordability, even though only one is the one that counts for the state. I, I think that's really excellent and I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm not sure if you under, understood or if I understood the answer. Um, so you have, you get a bonus, Within the density bonus, with, within the number of units in the bonus area, I'm assuming those are extra units beyond the first. So you've got 100 units. You're going to do, uh, I don't know, five percent at at the lowest level of affordability. When, when you get 100 more units, which of the are any of those units also affordable? Yes. And you, you said it, but help, help me get this. <laughs> sure, so um, it's a bit of a nuance, but important to recognize the 100 bonus units that you would get are market rate units. Those are bonus units meant to offset the cost of affordable housing. Right. The affordable housing is provided as part of the number of units provided the initial in your number. base, right? So uh, in a 100 unit project, if you're providing very low income units to qualify for state law, 11 of those, 11% right. must be very low income. So you, in that scenario, you'd get 11 very low income units. Out of 200 total units. Out of 200 total. Uh, and then you need to qualify for the supplemental bonus. We'll see the tables in a second, but that would be a scenario in which you'd have to provide 100 points to qualify, which would mean if this is a rental project, 3.7% uh, would be very low income. So that's another four <laughs> units. 6% would be low income, so that's another six units, and 7.3% would be uh, moderate income, so that's another eight units we're always rounding up. Okay, and uh, so we're only going to 120% AMI, is that right? For From the moderate income, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, just, just so you know, maybe not tonight, but at some point we do need to have a conversation about between 120 and 200%. Right. So I put on this, I jumped ahead on this screen. And thank you for, you know, putting it in words of one syllable for me. I do appreciate it. <laughs> um, I jumped ahead on this and put up on this screen the table that Lum was referring to. Um, I don't want to dive into that now, but it's there as a resource and I want to back up. Okay. Um, so the, the, the key principles would be based on location, a parcel will um, have a density, a supplemental density bonus tier assigned to it. Again, whether it's one, two, or three, 
uh, location attributes to transit, school, and uh, housing opportunity site. And then Milan um, explained that there was a, um, uh, a level of affordability that had to be provided in addition to the state. And uh, the other nuance that we haven't talked about yet is that we would allow a blended uh, mix of affordable units, no less than 60%, and community benefits. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. So eligibility points is is the the key thing that drives a supplemental density bonus program. They they are earned by providing uh, affordable units, and um, they are uh, in scale. They're proportionate to the amount of affordability provided, and that's what this table above shows. That. Um, these are the eligibility points awarded. Uh, if you have this percentage increase in uh, number of units in, in these income categories, f uh, affordable income categories within the project. Um, a developer may elect to fulfill or earn points through rental units here, um, or there's also a means for specialized, very low income housing to also earn density uh, separately in, the, in this way. So this, this program tends to be, uh, or is intended to be comprehensive in offering opportunities for a variety of affordable housing types um, and, and, and granting density bonuses. In addition, I mentioned um, the developer may elect to have a certain portion of their eligibility points earned through community benefits. Community benefits are things which have been identified as um, additive to to the neighborhood or to the community. And, and here, um, public open space, horse historic or landmark preservation, uh, infrastructure or capital improvements. If those are selected by the developer, they can earn points by providing those. And, and this outlines the schedule at which those points are earned. Um, we've had comments and discussion about this issue, particularly public open space. This is not, we aren't being uh, new or, or, or leading edge on this. This is a provision that's used throughout the state. Uh, San Francisco has experience with this. Uh, in our case, we're suggesting that when it comes forward, the, this public open space be accessible to the public uh, at all times. Do you want to add that, Milan? Just quickly to add also that all of the community benefits in this list would be additive to any uh, similar benefits that would be required for the project. So if you had a creek master plan that required open space, the space you provide to meet those provisions would not be eligible to generate points as well. So uh, you wouldn't be able to double dip in something that you're already obligated to. Um, thank you, and uh, I do want to call attention to one of our community benefit categories here is family-sized units, three or, or more bedrooms. Um, and then finally, there is a category, innovative community benefit, which is something we didn't think of. I mean, it would be a benefit the developer thought of that we haven't thought of, which would be um, subject to city council approval. Ordinarily, these projects would go through um, an entitlement process, uh, use permit, design review, uh, and would not come to council unless on appeal. Um, this is the only issue when it, if they have a community, innovative community benefit associated that you would actually be engaged and only to decide whether or not this qualifies. If I may, thank you. Um, so within this context, um, is this, do, does this apply to condominiums as well as to apartments? Yes. Apartments have a percent for physical accessibility or other kind of disability access requirements under Fair Housing Act. My understanding is that condominiums may not have that requirement. Um, is it possible to add in here a bonus for providing accessibility? Certainly, um, and I'm not, we would have to confirm that um, Simply condominiums. Simply similar yeah. percentage as is required in accessible apartments, right? 
It's possible and has also been done in other communities that have adopted this form of uh, right. menu, if you will, of benefits. Yeah, uh, and, and again, it's voluntary, it's on the menu. Thank you. So as I mentioned. Um, through, through the mayor, may I? Um, are these community benefits that are delineated here uh, restricted to the community benefits um, as such, um, except for where a developer decides to do what that you're proposing as an innovative community benefit? Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So What I'm trying to say is I'm gonna make up an example and let's decide that we want to have um, a theater, a children's theater, as a community benefit, for example. Uh, could we add that on here as, and I, I'm not proposing that, I'm just picking a widget here, or is this something that comes down through the state or some other no. funding stream? Yeah, no, and that's a great question. It, it, truly, I, and, and a lot, um, ask Milan to chime in as well, but, Really, the innovative community benefit is is really defined by the developer. A developer may come forward and say, hey, we really see a need in the community for children theater. We would like to provide that space on site and make it available to the public. That then would need to come to council for approval. So and, and the developer proposes that something is a benefit to the community and the council has to approve that it is right. indeed a benefit in the yes. opinion of the council. And is it seems to me that then that leaves the council and our constituents in receiving what the developer believes to be in the best interest of the community instead of it being a, a two-way communication. So what I'm trying to get at is may we amend and add other options that we would like to see on the menu for, for development? It, it could certain, those type of benefits can be added. These are pretty standard. Mm -hmm. So it may be that the council decides tonight that that's a type of benefit that you wish to add as a sort of prescribed benefit, what we would do is um, figure out what would be an appropriate points uh, generating factor with that benefit and define it a little better. Um, but I do want to clarify that a developer's proposed innovative benefit would be a discussion with council. It wouldn't be um, yeah, no, a yes I and no. I really yeah. do appreciate that, and I don't want to overburden. You know, it's clear that a lot of work has gone into this, and I don't want to overburden you with trying to figure mm -hmm. out point systems and so forth. And I do understand that it would be a dialogue, but I also like the idea of you know we're going into goal setting and into budget hearings and so forth that we would have some ability to to put out there the things that we'd like because if you don't ask, you don't get. No, I, that's very true. So. Um, it, if I may follow up on that, it would also be helpful since we heard that other communities have included, for example, uh, accessibility or at least universal design elements. Uh, it would be nice to know what other communities have had on their list like this and not only have this list but be able to review. Obviously, I'm, I'm very excited about this. I think it's a great idea. I want it to move forward. I think we will want to revisit this list and uh, I'm hearing from at least one other colleague an interest in that. Uh, so if we could see what other communities are have on their list, uh, that would be helpful as well. So uh, just to comment briefly, that's certainly doable. Uh, in fact, we started with a much longer list when we went and brought this forward in an initial draft uh, with the public and with the Planning Commission. Uh, internally with staff as well. Um, at the time, or when we initially started, we had contributions to public art, we had contributions to accessibility in units. Uh, percentage of units had to be um, designed in such a way to meet certain standards, et cetera. Um, so we have started from a longer list. Um, the only thing maybe worth mentioning here is that some of the feedback we received was to start with a program that was uh, more laser focused on some of the key ones that the community felt was necessary and then look to the innovative community benefit as an open avenue for conversation about some of the uh, unique issues that might arise and that might really be interpreted as a community benefit at the time. Um, I, I very much appreciate that. I consider accessibility to be a laser focused issue. 
So that's, that's my opinion on that one. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. So um, unlike the state density bonus program, which is allowed by right, uh, which it doesn't require any additional entitlement. The supplemental density program uh, does require a use permit uh, in addition to um, uh, design review. The um, findings that we have here are special findings that we would apply. Uh, they are intended in large part to help to ensure that we're properly implementing or using our eligibility point program, the things that we just reviewed. And um, then to find, and then a point that Milan made that if there's a community benefit, it's not a proposed benefit that is otherwise a requirement. Um, and then here we, say, we see that the, uh, if a community benefit is, is not on the list and it's an innovative uh, benefit, we, we have here findings that um, get at to establish that, it, that they are appropriate. Um, so we had uh, a number of comments come out in, in the process of determining the geography of the supplemental density program, and I just want to review the key ones with you here. One is um, preservation, district preservation. As I alluded to earlier, we do have a provision that says supplemental density is not allowed in the preservation districts, but that there are three, uh, uh, I should say, land use designations. Um, there are three land use designations which lie adjacent to our existing preservation districts where we have already planned increased intensity of development and we do think it's appropriate that a supplemental density but limited amount of density be permitted in those instances. And, and, and again, a use permit and design review is required. Um, uh, this exhibit is intended to show you where those areas are, the, the dashed circles represent the edges where we have those three land use designations adjoining historic or within historic districts. And those would be places where um, we would allow 25% over the state's 35% um, uh, density. Um, was this um, approved by the um, Cultural Heritage Board? Did they review this document? No, we did not bring it to them, though we did notice the hearing and, and uh, we heard from members of the community, and I can't say if members of the Cultural Heritage Board okay. um, commented directly as residents. I think it would be helpful uh, at some point in this process to, to drill down in this particular area with regard to the Cultural Heritage Board. Um, one of the, the things that I would like to note here related to cultural heritage um, or uh, preservation district and historic resource protection is that the state law really favors the developer in exercising the density bonus, except when we can find that there would be an adverse impact to a historic resource, that would be a reason for denial for a 35% density bonus anywhere in the city, as well as in, in this uh, supplemental density area. I, I'm just looking at predictability issues and would really rather that they be on top of this upfront. Um, okay. And, and also, I think earlier I had asked about the, the sort of preservation of facades along 4th Street, and I don't see that re reflected here. So I'm trying to figure out how do we include, I see it in Railroad Square area, but I don't see it in our in our other 4th Street near the Courthouse Square. Well, any provision of, the, of our design guidelines would continue to be applicable to any project with a bonus or not. Um, so I, I uh, we have a question, uh, sorry. Thank you, Mary. This, this is actually in response to um, Cousin Bercombe's comment or question about the, the um, Cultural Heritage Board. Wouldn't they be working on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to an, an entire, um, what, uh, grouping of, of properties? 
that's correct. I don't know correct. how they would weigh in on a, on a neighborhood as opposed to a case by case or a project, a specific project. You're correct, as a project came forward and if there was a cultural heritage board, uh, if, 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 if a landmark permit was required for review by the Cultural Heritage Board, the project would have to obtain that. I, quite frankly, had not thought about that circumstance, but that, that would apply. Okay, thank you. Um, so we talked about neighborhood protection. That was a early on theme. Initially, when we proposed the project, we had the supplemental density bonus um, apply to the city's priority development areas, which extend along the major thoroughfares within the city. And the concern there was that the density would be too abrupt of a change next to the single family residential areas. So we rolled it back to the downtown area. Um, excuse me, to the, to the station area, station specific plan areas. Um, but we kept this provision regarding the 25% cap on, on areas that are designated next, on sites that are designated medium low residential and near uh, transit and schools. So as in the future, should this ordinance or, or should, should those uh, station specific plan area boundaries change as they might in the downtown area, this ordinance would apply and it would have built-in protection for any new residential area adjacent to um, the, uh, the downtown. Um, and this, this chart here illustrates the mechanics of how that uh, density restriction is applied adjacent to uh, residential neighborhood, the small, the single family residential neighborhoods. Um, so we had some consistent themes and comments that came up during the review uh, that, it, that supplemental density or any density needed to be compatible with adjacent development neighborhoods, uh, that management of impacts to historic resources needed to be first and foremost, we needed to not have adverse effects on those resources. And um, we also needed to be realistic about what increased density like this may have in terms of impacts on neighborhoods such as parking. So in response, this lists a variety of things that are incorporated into the ordinance that help to address those comments. One, as I mentioned, we have use permit and design review, and I might add, uh, if, if applicable, cultural heritage board. Um, we have restricted the supplemental density to the station area plan boundaries. Um, and then we have these land use designations where we do anticipate the higher intensity uses. Um, the, the tiered supplemental density bonus really reflects what we planned for in terms of increased density downtown. Um, we're, it's, we don't, we're not proposing intense development uh, where we couldn't support it with our infrastructure and road network. Um, the other important issues uh, that we haven't uh, uh, discussed is that the final bullet point is we've not expanded the number of uh, concessions and incentives that are available to developers. They still get three. Um, they may earn it through the state's density bonus, but they won't get any more um, through the supplemental density bonus. Um, this outlines the actions taken by Planning Commission. We had our first meeting in July. There were a number of questions and issues and some direction to staff. We came back in October and uh, resolved those matters and on a 5-1 on a vote, we had um, a recommendation before you tonight to approve uh, this ordinance. Um, I'll add also there's a negative declaration uh, accompanying this, this action. Uh, this talks about the notification and um, the negative declaration was prepared in this case because we really wanted to be transparent about the potential impacts associated with future development that might occur under the supplemental density program. And we were able to leverage the previous EIRs that had been prepared for the downtown area as well as the North Station. And 
those EIRs analyzed a number of alternatives, including one which focused downtown development and found it increased development such as might occur under the supplemental density program and found that that would be actually an environmentally superior alternative. Um, and, and so we have good CEQA basis to move forward with increasing development downtown. Um, so the recommendation tonight is that the council um, approve, adopt a negative declaration for the density bonus and then introduce uh, an ordinance amending zoning code chapter 2031 um, to update the uh, density bonus law. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Right back to council. Any additional questions for staff? See then, do we have any cards? So this is a public hearing, so I open the public hearing. And first speaker, Terry Shore, followed by John Lowry. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, a city council member, staff members of the public. My name is Terry Shore, regional director for the North Bay for Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, we did submit a letter um, in support in, of the proposed ordinance before you. Um, we, Greenbelt Alliance um, did file very extensive comments during the summer with concerns about the CEQA review and the extent of the uh, supplemental density bonus program. So we appreciate the fact that staff um, uh, responded to that and narrated it to those um, two station area plans that did have extensive um, EIR and public input at the time. So uh, we feel very comfortable uh, supporting that. Um, I also support the comments by several council members about some of the uh, innovative community benefits. And we would also like you to consider as you go forward and maybe tweak some of those or spell those out that you could also consider things like zero net energy building getting points, um, you know, green building, climate, smart building, um, and things along those lines um, that might benefit the community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, John Lowry, followed by Tom Sells. Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm John Lowry, and it's been a long time since I've been to one of these long, late meetings at the City Council. Uh, but uh, the, the conversation was was interesting to me, and and I, I, I understand uh, a lot better about the trade-offs that we've made in making these decisions. So I would like to support the the staff's recommendation. But I wanted to bring to your attention uh, something that I I, th I sent to you uh, uh, last week um, that I, I, I request that you consider. Uh, a, a floor area uh, density bonus program in the future. This was enabled by uh, state legislation, was called AB 2372, and it would, it would allow for a greater number of smaller units, mostly low income affordable apartments, uh, without expanding the building envelope more than would be anticipated it, with the actions that you're taking, taking this evening. Uh, it, would, it would encourage a greater number of smaller affordable apartments, which would provide for supportive housing, serving uh, disabled and, and or homeless people, uh, gr uh, the growing number of low-income seniors, uh, low-income couples and individuals, and you may want to uh, consider uh, market rate smaller units, which may, uh, uh, may lend to uh, downtown uh, vitality or may assist and encourage in downtown vitality. Um, I recognize that any new program has unintended consequences, but I think it would be possible to anticipate uh, the potential concerns. So there's, I'm not suggesting any particular action. I would just like to familiarize you with, with this new piece of legislation, and I'll discuss that uh, further with, uh, with staff in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And the night is still young, just so you know. Uh, Thomas Ells. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Thomas Ells, Tra uh, Transportation Land Use Committee, and we support the density bonus program and uh, have been in regards to SMART and 
particularly even with regard to the uh, North Station area plan as well. Uh, so those are great. Um, I would also point out to Councilwoman Victoria Fleming that uh, this, that was not an unusual request. In fact, there was a plan for a theater to be placed right here. And unfortunately, the Green Music Center supplanted that. Uh, we, we need something. And I would also point out that um, as far as children's theater, Les Miserables has been uh, continuously uh, produced for over 33 years. And uh, in 2002, about halfway through this period, uh, they started a children's musical, Les Miserables, all around the world. And uh, that w was exemplified in the 25th anniversary edition, which came out 2010, and is really incredibly fantastic in there. And this, uh, this handbill right here is the production of this for Petaluma. So they will at the Phoenix have a children's teen musical at the Phoenix Theater of which the rehearsals are in Katati. So it is pretty close at hand if we do consider opening our opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Would anyone else like to make a comment during this public hearing? You needn't, hadn't filled out a speaker card? Seen, yes we do, Daisy. Yeah, um, Daisy Fisty Lines, Sonoma County Conservation Action. Thanks for asking, Tom. Um, I just wanted to reiterate comments that we've given earlier in the process at both the Planning Commission and an earlier hearing before this body, um, supporting the density bonus being adopted and seeing it as a great tool to hopefully enhance the downtown. So that's all. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council during this public hearing? Seeing lack of movement, we will close the public hearing. Mr. Tibbetts will bring it to you for the motion and any final comments or further discussion. So I have a resolution and an ordinance. I move a resolution of the, an ordinance, excuse me, a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Rosa adopting a negative declaration for zoning code text amendment to amend zoning code chapter 20-31, density bonus and other developer incentives to be consistent with updates to California government code section 65915, state density bonus law, and to extend state law with a supplemental density bonus of up to 100% within the boundaries of the downtown station area specific plan and the North Santa Rosa Station Specific Plan, file number REZ 18-004, and waive for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion second. Any, you have that look of your face like you have more questions. I do have a question, and it has to do with what um, what John was just talking about as far as the square footage. Can I, can I get staff's response to that to that concept? And can I, I think about, you know, affordab affordability by design, and it seems like a perfect way to do it on its on the surface. So, um, what would be the response to, to his recommendation or his suggestion? It, and unfortunately, it's a rather simple one. We haven't analyzed the the option, um, and and I think we would need to take time to fully consider the. Um, the outcomes that, that are possible. I, I understand the assertion that the potential might be more smaller units could be developed with, with such a program, um, but we haven't looked at that. The proposal or the idea came forward rather late in the process, so. So as not to, to disrupt the process, uh, if, if I would assume that if there became, if we identified value in, in adding that to the ordinance uh, in time, that we could that we could do that. Absolutely, and, and this is a great moment for me to point out that we have in this ordinance before you a five-year check-in. Uh, not to say that it can't happen sooner, uh, but the purpose of that was to build in a time when we know we're going to come to the council and say, this is what works. This is this doesn't work, or here's something new on the block, let's try it. Okay, I appreciate that, because it's, it's something that that uh, had come to me through John and uh, Mr. Lowry a number of, actually a number of years ago, and uh, this was before the state had taken its action. So um, I'm, I'm still interested in hearing more about that in, in the future, and I thank you. Thank you. Are there any other 
Comments, Mr. Tibbetts? Yeah, I have one more comment, and that is just to actually in the future uh, to explore the idea that um, that we actually develop, or not we, whatever future council has the opportunity to develop a list of community benefits uh, that it could exist in projects. You know, because this is voluntary, I, I think that is, if nothing, an opportunity that once in a while might bear some fruit and help the city council achieve its priorities, whatever they may be for that council's term. Um, the other thing too is I'm particularly interested in, and I don't know how many of you have spoken with um, Lake over at Disabled um, Legal Services Center, but they're actually pushing an initiative right now at the County of Sonoma called Visitability, um, which is all about guiding accessibility, creating wider doorways, creating zero step um, entry access points, and they're asking develop new developments to voluntarily put this in um, when new development occurs. And so I think that should also be one of the, the criteria that we look at the programs already developed and fleshed out and, and uh, you know, for the folks who are mobility impaired or have, you know, something that they're dealing with, that would be a really good thing to include. Um, so with that, I have no further comments. Um, Councilmember Combs. Thank you, and thank you for, for that um, se sort of second on the suggestion for uh, universal design or full accessibility, depending on what you bring back. I would hope that you would bring it back to this council and not to some future council in five years. I'd really like to see the um, discussion of areas for consider, uh, excuse me, the, um, the expanded list of community benefits to come back to us pretty quickly after the, um, after the goal setting so that it's, you know, aligns with some of our goal setting issues. Um, I think we need to get it in pretty, pr pretty quickly and I don't see a harm in having an extended list there. Um, although I appreciate your wanting to be focused on getting the housing built issues. Um, I also, it does concern me and I appreciate my colleague um, being aware of the current charter for the, um, well, charter is the wrong word, the current um, Cultural Heritage Board charge. But since we are talking about preservation districts, I think it really is advisable to take this to them and just double check. I obviously will support this moving forward, but I really think we need to double check that the little red dotted lines are capturing what we want them to capture and that you are able also to bring that back to us um, with their uh, comments about the little dotted lines there. Um, I really wanna thank you for this. Uh, this is, uh, this density bonus ordinance update is a key, meets a key goal that our council has had in stimulating housing in Santa Rosa. This is, this is a major piece of that and I very much appreciate the hard work, uh, the outreach you have done. Uh, the consideration that you've given. This, this is a major piece for, for our council. Um, it's been time for Santa Rosa to grow up downtown. And I really wanna thank you for making it possible for us to do that. Okay, council, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. And I would also like to take this opportunity. I know, um, I'm not sure if this may be a first, I know it's the first of this year where one department has done a joint planning commission, uh, city council uh, session, a study session, a report item and a public hearing. I think you're the only department we've heard from, but um, I, I'd like to uh, applaud all of you, you know, Director Gillen. It, 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 it's a lot of work and as Council Member Combs just said, we're heading in the right direction. There's not one magic bullet that's gonna solve all of our issues but we're heading that right direction. I appreciate the efforts of your team, Director Gillen, so thank you. Okay, moving on, but wait. One more ordinance. There, there could be more. Oh, we have yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. I, I move an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa Code, updating zoning code chapter 20-31, density bonus and other developer incentives to be consistent with updates to California Government Code section 65915, state density bonus law and to extend state law with a supplemental density bonus of up to 100% within the boundaries of the downtown station area specific plan and the North Santa Rosa station specific plan file number REZ 18-004 and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Your votes?
passes unanimously. Any more, Mr. Tibbetts? Make sure I get this right. Okay, it's early. Um, all right, next on the agenda is no written communication. Do we have any additional cards from the state clerk? All right, meeting adjourned.